The Franklin Humanities Institute 2018 to 2019 annual theme has been water. And we've been exploring many aspects of humanistic and artistic responses to water from oceanic voyages to lives built around rivers, from aquatic aesthetics to refugee migration, from water shortage to floods, fluidity to flow, and from water conceived through sacred forms to aquatic life worlds and ontologies. It's encompassed questions of form and formlessness, the shape of water as it were, what is sometimes called the blue humanities, including thinking with the ocean about art that addresses the oceanic, the philosophical roots of the law of the sea, and the distinctions uh, between land and sea, engaging how the modern novel, for example, was born, as it were, on the ocean, to cities and other habitable spaces growing with and around rivers. We've been asking, what are the aesthetics of water? What are the politics of water? And what are the forms of water? And how, from our largely terra-centric view of the world, do we understand the aquatic variously as element, force, life source, backdrop, limit, border, space, and place. And it's within this context that it's my great pleasure to introduce the events of today, Mediterranean med Mediations with Lydia Curti and Ian Chambers, who have come to us from Naples Orientale. They will be speaking as part of our theme on water through the lens of their particular interests on the topic, on the manner in which the ordering of the world happens in feminist writing and other forms of cultural production, like TV, in Lydia Curti's work, and on the aesthetics and politics of Mediterranean cultural production in Ian Chambers's. Both are profoundly shaped um, by, in fact, did shape what we now call Birmingham Cultural Studies, and both um, uh, have also been shaped by what they have called in a co-edited anthology, The Postcolonial Question. I've got show and tell things today. Um, our first speaker today will be Ian Chambers. Um, Ian teaches cultural, postcolonial, and Mediterranean studies at the University of Naples Orientale. He is founder of the Center of Postcolonial and Gender Studies and the seminar series Borderscapes in that same institution. He is the author of, again, more show and tell, Location, Borders, and Beyond in its large and small versions. <laughs> <laughs> Mediterranean Crossings, The Politics um, of an Interrupted Modernity, Migrancy, Culture, Identity, and Culture After Humanism, History, Culture, Subjectivity. <clears throat> um, probably the most, um, the most relevant for this question of more water, um, well, actually, a number of them have, have implications for that. Um, is uh, is uh, the the book uh, Mediterranean Crossings, um, and um, the the interdisciplinary it, it's an interdisciplinary inv investigation uh, which is informed by um, uh, an, a, a challenge I suppose to the prevalent Western perceptions of the region. Um, uh, which tend to be fixed on particular geographical, political, and historical classifications. Um, Ian really addresses the way in which there is a European inclination to, to view um, uh, the Mediterranean as a frontier, but he pushes against that, describing the sea as a different kind of environment with different kinds of metaphorical as well as political, cultural uh, forces, um, focusing on questions of uh, the movement of waters, indeed, currents, tides, storms. Actually, in a class that I've been teaching, we've been trying to think about exactly these ki the kinds of aesthetics that come from things like the crests of waves. Um, he stresses the sea's ancient function as a means of communication. Um, which, which, is, which stands in contrast to uh, artificial barriers and borders that, um, that, that may be uh, colonial borders, but, but other borders as well, that are put into place, that push against the, 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 the fluidity of the sea and the question of such things as um, uh, jurisdiction. Um, 
That's not to say, of course, and he doesn't say such a thing, that the free sea is itself uh, an idea that is developed without jurisdiction. We know from the, the, the thoughts that we've been having through the, over the last year that, of course, uh, the jurisdiction of the sea and the idea of the free sea is itself a product of a push against um, uh, um, the, uh, the colonial movement of the Spanish and Portuguese, right? So in the work of someone like Hugo Grotius, we see the idea of the free sea being developed as an anti-jurisdiction movement, uh, a push for an idea of the free sea, which was actually all about um, uh, giving, giving a force for Dutch, um, Dutch colonial expansion. Right. Um, so, so Ian explores the movement of peoples, languages, trade, music, cuisine, ideas through uh, through the uh, through the what do we call it? The region, the um, the sea, the ocean. Um, I'm. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm also sort of struck very much in the way in which he can move um, uh, um, uh, among various media. Um, I, I'm a particular fan of a beautiful piece that he's written on um, on Isaac Julian's wonderful um, uh, uh, installation, uh, Western Union Small Boats. Um, and uh, I'm going to stop talking now because I know that you're not here to listen to me and I could wax lyrical about uh, his work for some time. Um, but uh, with no more ado, I present you Ian Chambers. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ranji. Uh, wow, it's kind of difficult to follow that. But <laughs> okay, so I'm going to um, try and talk about the Mediterranean. I've called this talk Mediterranean Blues, uh, Thinking with the Diver. I'll explain what that means in a minute. And um, I guess uh, here in North Carolina, we're a long way from the Mediterranean. Um, but I'm trying to talk about things which I hope have a reverberation and connections with uh, interest and concerns here. And I'd also above all like to thank uh, Professor Ranjana Khanna and uh, Sarah Rogers for making this uh, hopefully conversation possible. Uh, so I'm going to, the idea is to begin from the sea. So the idea of going offshore, being at sea, which means also, you know, in English to, uh, to be lost a bit. Uh, we have to renegotiate uh, your bearings uh, and where you think you find yourself. Um, and it's undoing, in some ways, a series of premises which tend to uh, root uh, disciplinary procedures for explaining the Mediterranean, explaining modernity, and suggesting that uh, these can be undone or have to be renegotiated once one's taken offshore. So it means also, I guess, uh, given how the Mediterranean has been uh, framed or inframed or framed uh, by a European perspective for at least the last 200 years, uh, it's a about trying to think about how to set Europe adrift, so the dominant or hegemonic definitions of the Mediterranean, how to, to be set them adrift a bit, um, to raise questions about interrupting the narrative. By the narrative, I don't just mean the poetic or literary narrative, I mean also the discursive narrative, uh, which may be a sociological, anthropological, or political science or area studies. Setting all that adrift uh, by raising questions about who gets to map, who gets the right, who has the right to map and the rate and explain and manage uh, this geo geohistorical space. So uh, this also opens up questions about thinking, uh, one of the th thinking with. Um, so the idea of it's not so much uh, thinking of the, with, uh, of the Mediterranean as an object uh, to be uh, defined by disciplinary premises and procedures, but in terms of thinking rather with. So uh, it's leading to a more messy, uh, unstable, uh, understanding of how knowledge, knowledge formations, and cultural and political practices come to operate. Um, and that means also raising questions about using other maps, maps which have not been authorized by the European gaze and its dis disciplinary procedures, uh, and also engaging with other languages. Uh, I mean both linguistically, and I'll talk about that towards the end, but other languages of uh, apprehension. So uh, I'm thinking here, uh, because I'm particularly interested, as uh, Ranji said, I'm particularly interested in the visual arts uh, and music, sound, how these can propose, uh, become, be transformed, I suppose, into 
critical dispositions, critical apparatuses. Uh, I've not generally thought, considered in those terms. Music or the visual arts are normally considered as illustrations of historical or cultural processes that are apparently happening elsewhere. But I'm making an argument here about how the music and visual arts permit us to travel critically, often into areas or spaces which more uh, established, institutionalized languages such as sociology or historiography uh, fail to allow. So, and uh, the other thing is also obviously uh, how the Mediterranean today has become a sort of um, what I would call a hot spot um, in the sense with the centrality of what is called the crisis of migration, which I will argue is not a crisis, but it's a structural reality, a structural feature of modernity itself. But uh, so to think about the Mediterranean uh, in terms of also what I would call um, a migrating modernity, that is, it's not that you find migration within modernity, but perhaps the motor and the real disposition of modernity is out of migration, both of physical bodies and lives, cultures, histories, languages, and, and so on. And uh, this, and the, the so-called crisis of migration today, that is the people traveling from the so-called global south to try and enter fortress Europe, and the situation you have here, right, in North America, people coming from the south of the border, the Mexican border, the U.S.-Mexican border, uh, is to think about uh, this. Uh, is to think in terms of the Mediterranean as a, a renewed centrality raised by the question of migration, uh, by refugees and the dispossessed, and at the same time, all the violence over sovereignty, Israel, Palestine, uh, that occurs in the Mediterranean. So this new centrality of the Mediterranean. Uh, this is a work by the Palestinian artist uh, Mona Hatoum, Hot Spot, where of course. Uh, the hot spot is not simply that in the Mediterranean. The world is a hot spot. The world is a hot spot. But I want to concentrate on this idea of how the Mediterranean has become a hot spot compared to like 20 or two or three decades ago when it was normally considered a place to go on holiday, good food, good wine. Uh, but it was time out. It was a place to have time out from modernity, which apparently has been elaborated, elaborated elsewhere, north of the Alps, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. And to make an argument about it, there's a new centrality, how the Mediterranean has in some ways become a laboratory of modernity in, in many different ways. And uh, connected to this idea of a laboratory of, mo of modernity and the Mediterranean and migration is uh, the, thinking this in terms of the modern migrant uh, as uh, the critical challenge, as the critical challenge to concepts of citizenship, statehood, and the narrative powers of historiography given that historiography tends to be always narrated through the, the placeholder of the nation state. Uh, so thinking of migration, migrating histories, cultures, bodies, uh, raising questions about belonging, citizenship, and about the very nature of the historical graphical uh, operation, uh, and the models that sustain this idea of history that operates through the nation state. Um, okay, uh, so this is the question of centrality migration. Um, this, is, this is me on a beach Seminar on the beach, right? Uh, Lampedusa, uh, this is 2013. I'm trying to explain to very bemused bathers the importance of thinking about the Mediterranean and migration. Uh, also, I was using music. I couldn't play the music very loud because there's a, a reserve for sea turtles, breeding sea tur turtles. So there's no, uh, you can't amplify the voice or anything. But uh, so this is a serious sociologist on the beach. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, is 2013. Uh, this is May or June, I can't remember. Uh, in October that year, uh, 360 migrants died, were drowned, about 200 meters from this, this beach. Uh, There's a famous uh, drowning of the migrants. Um, I'll come back to that as well. Uh, the other element I want to uh, emphasize is this idea of Mediterranean blues. Um, you know, that is learning from uh, different ways to sound out, uh, orchestrate modernity, uh, using, a, a, I don't know, dissonance, uh, other notes. Um, so uh, music and blues as method, music as method, not again, not as an illustration, but as a method, adopting other scales of interpretation, uh, bringing into play the dissonance, the slide between the institutional notes and those that sound another history in a different key. So the blues, uh, African-American diaspora and the music of the blues, but also uh, Arab music, different scales, uh, the maquam, the maquam, uh, sort of microtonalities in the gaps of the official score. And also then uh, drawing on the uh, lessons of the modern black diasporas uh, and the making of modernity from far below, from far below. Uh, and there to dub it, dub, Jamaica, Kingston, dubbing it, uh, repeating the imposed, repeating the imposed, 
and the inherited to rework it and release the unsuspected and the not yet registered. So uh, learning from elsewhere and from the transit of translation. And it, I've tried to do this in a couple of books which are in Italian. One is called Mediterranean Blues, Musics, Postcolonial Melancholia and Maritime Thinking. And this more recent publication from a couple of weeks ago, which I wrote with a young colleague called Extending Gramsci's Understanding of Southern Question and this much wider series of maps. So it's the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean question. So this is to locate in the Mediterranean an archive, an archive, um, an aquatic archive, if we like, that interrogates and interrupts the institutional organization of events. This implies tearing history away from chronology and the cult of origins in order to evaluate the contingent. So from being a static site and the backdrop of approved narratives, the sea, the Mediterranean, <laughs> invariably national, the Mediterranean itself becomes a contingent configuration, an agitated archive where the sea is history, a famous uh, line from the Caribbean poet Derek Walcott. So going offshore, uh, loosening the uh, terrestrial grounding of our thought and practices, drifting into other currents, constructing a compass more suitable to negotiate and navigate the multiplicities of the ongoing formation of the Mediterranean modernity registering what is both sedimented and suspended in its waters as a perpetual interrogation of landlocked certainties, from the bodies of contemporary migrants to the centrality of the sea in the realization of the Occidental colonial enterprise. The sea is central, of course, historically, although it's very rarely taken into consideration, the seaborne empires of the West. Uh, if we look at a map of the, uh, of the Mediterranean, everything is laid out flat. Borders are clearly defined. All is seemingly captured by the eye, rendered measurable and knowable. This is the basis for the geopolitical chessboard where everything is put on the dissecting table. It apparently provides a neutral and disinterested or scientific rendering of reality. It appeals to a, a liberal organization uh, of the world where all the actors are treated as though equal permitting the analysis to remain balanced and impartial, something that is patently impossible to sustain when considering present-day relations between the northern and southern shores of the Mediterranean, or the dramatically unequal relations of power that sustain the violence in Palestine-Israel. There are also, at the same time, less neutral and more troubling maps and locations this is the island of Lampedusa, which lies 200 kilometers, that's like 150 miles, south of Tunis and south of Algiers, the city of Algiers. It's further south. Lampedusa is part of the African continent, geologically uh, speaking. So uh, the same space can also be crossed by other eyes. This is a Turkish map from 1803. Uh, and it, these, the suggestion I want to propose here, these rethinking the location of Lampedusa, or rethinking the other gazes, the other ways of, uh, the other perspectives that cross the, uh, the Mediterranean, uh, that come from elsewhere, actually crease uh, and create folds in existing understandings. The folds, which deepen. If we were to think with, not of, but with the Mediterranean, and float in its diverse currents, we could consider the manner in which it constitutes an interrogative archive and counter space to prevalent understandings of modern Europe. Both in, but not completely of Europe, after all, two thirds of the Mediterranean is composed by its African and Asian shorelines, two thirds, two thirds, okay? The making of the modern Mediterranean as a subaltern historical and cultural formation interrupts the logic that the world can simply be laid out, flat as a map, ripe for appropriation. To reopen this archive, we need to consider how the ongoing composition of the multiple histories and diverse cultural formations propose a different series of maps and coordinates. Such a return permits a reiteration in which the past, the past intersects, confuses, and creolizes what tends to be considered closed matters, history. Uh, to reassemble the fragments of the past in this manner is to construct an alternative sense of the present. This is to operate uh, what Ranjana Kana would call a cut on the body of modernity that leads to another critical montage. This permits us to engage also with the entanglements of the represented and the repressed in an emergent and dissonant 
an emergent and dissonant constellation that offers no unique frame or horizon. It is also to insist on the global injustice sustained by the general equivalence and indifference of capital. Further, this is to engage with the maritime regions that register the limits of the rational grasp of the world. Registering the limits of the rational grasp of the world. There we encounter the shipwrecks of the leveling mechanisms of Occidental reason and the hegemony of the Kantian subject that obliterate the specificities of lives lived, whose very presence and persistence implicitly disturb that order of knowledge. Those dematerialized formulations that render the world knowable and, trans and transparent to a particular will to power. A particular will to power, which also explains the disregard, the disregard for lives lost in the streets of the United States and the Mediterranean Sea. This is a quote from Denise uh, Ferreira da Silva. So, uh, thinking with the diver. Inside a tomb, uh, <clears throat> rediscovered uh, 50 years ago, we see a distinctly dark male body that befuddles 19th century Hel Hellenism uh, and the transformation of Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary, and Greek gods and heroes into white Aryans. Some 2,500 years ago, a body descends gracefully through the air. This famous painting on the inside of a, the lid of a sarcophagus, of a coffin, a sarcophagus, uh, La Tomba del Tufatore, uh, <coughs> was destined for, to invisibility. It's destined never to be seen. It's inside the lid of it of the sarcophagus. Uh, but this uh, figure, destined to invisibility, actually, with its rediscovery, lights up the present in an emergent reconfiguration of the past. This life figure in full flight is surrounded on the four internal sides of the tomb by reclining male figures constituting a symposium. Again, never to be seen inside the tomb. It comes from the Greek settlement of uh, Poseidonia, uh, better known by its, Greek, uh, by its Roman name of Pestum, which lies on the coast uh, south of Salerno. Salerno. Uh, as a Greek colony, uh, Pestum was part of the expansion of the Peloponnesian city-states that stretched over Homer's wine-dark sea uh, into Asia Minor, northwards to the steppes bordering the Black Sea, and westwards through Sicily and uh, southern Italy to the coastlines of modern France and Spain. Like all colonialisms, like all colonialisms, it invariably involved conquest, together with the subjugation and enslavement of indigenous populations. The land, as always, was never empty. The land, was, as always, was never empty. Control had to be wrested from local authority. Blood would have been spilt. Lives arbitrarily terminated. It involved the brutal imposition of someone on someone's soil, memory, and territory of an imported cultural or an imported culture and its political management. This is the violence that accompanies what more recently has come to be identified in the specificities of settler colonialism, not foreign to the histories of the Carolinas, right? Okay. Today, much of this uh, detail falls away. Much of this detail falls away. Lost in the myths of a European nostalgia for the presumed uh, purity and nobility of its origins. Yet it is deeply etched into the architectural grammar of contemporary Occidental cities, uh, where neoclassical buildings imitate the illusory, the illusory whiteness of antiquity. We find this uh, purposeful whitewashing of the past from Imperial London, Paris, Berlin, and Washington, to fascist Italy, to <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so uh, but you must remember that the temples of Pestum, like all the temples in the uh, in the Greek and uh, Roman imperial world, were all decorated in very vivid colours. You can't see them here because they faded after two thousand years, two thousand five hundred years. But they were all decorated in very vivid colours, very different from the the whitewashing that occurred with nineteenth century Hellenism uh, to propose as this sort of pure sense of origins and beginnings of the Western. <clears throat> so uh, all this means to, uh, to think uh, and with and follow the reverberations uh, revealed in the profound anachronism, the profound anachronism of the historiographical 
operation. Opening the tomb, opening the archive, to quickly sketch, as so I'm doing this morning, like the anonymous painters who probably had 48 hours in which to uh, do this work before the lid was closed, like what, they, what they thought would be forever. Uh, this is to, to suggest a set of connections and coordinations or coordinates with which we could choose to navigate the Afro-Asian European matrix of the Mediterranean. Of course, without abandoning the skilled disciplinary competence that, the brought, that has brought this past to light, archaeology, the history of ancient Greece, this also means refusing to reduce its materials to a single inventory of time. It is to adopt a more ironic relationship to origins in a sort of archaeology of archaeology, we're seeking to uncover another genealogy that does not merely mirror a European will to power. To insist on the anachronistic as method and consider the historical determination of time <clears throat> is to evidence the juxtaposition and entanglements that wrench the colonized past from the terms in which they were once cast. This is, to, um, this is deliberately to unsettle an established consensus in which the conditions of semantic, cultural, and political production are guaranteed by their origins in a seemingly distinct and separate past. Now they need constantly to renegotiate their place in the world as an ongoing presence, a past which does not pass, which accumulates in the present with a series of interrogations. So drawing out of the very heartlands of European civilization is Greek and Mediterranean origins, another set of questions, uh, we can encounter further geographies of understanding, other axes of interpretation that render the seemingly distant past both proximate and potentially disruptive. Yeah, the music's happening in a minute. <laughs> um, the, flax, uh, the flat taxonomy of time Everything in its assigned chronological and cultural place is abruptly interrupted and cut up, ready for another collage of comprehension, another assemblage of understanding. Like the painting of a diver, executed for unseeing eyes, but now recovered and exposed, we too can consider hidden and sedimented matters that propose other memories. This is to raise questions of property and ownership. Who has the right to narrate and why? Within what sort of genealogy is memory owned and authorized? Seeking to reply, seeking to reply, brings us to propose a shift in the existing premises of the human and social sciences and their actual legislation on such questions and perspectives and prospects. Breaking apart the philological imperative of linearity and reassembling its elements in another configuration invites us to take a deeper responsibility for our language. It is to recognize its transitory, it's our language, all the languages we employ, its transitory precariousness and its perpetual vulnerability to investment by a past we can never fully own and neither we can never fully recover nor own. A past which is still in still being elaborated, a past which is still being elaborated comes to us from the future. Taking our language in hand in this manner better equips us to cross what the Jamaican philosopher Lewis Gordon calls the geography of reason. Here, uh, archives are not restricted to the textual traces of the past and to what historians call the documents. But the questions begged here, or the question begged here, is what constitutes a document or an archive? What are the cultural and political forces that authorize their constitution and recognition? Here, I'm drawing upon what, be, what might be called um, the post-scholarly style uh, of, uh, in the Afro-diasporic manner of telling, I'm referring to the works of people like uh, Sadia Hartman, Fred Morton, uh, Christina Sharp, uh, Ashil Benbe, and others, and how this style of telling helps us to uh, center the necropolitics of modernity while plumbing in the depths of a disavowed colonial and neo-colonial cords of connection between the Mediterranean and Atlantic worlds. All of this means uh, returning objects to the density of both their cultural lineage and their resonance in the echo chambers of historical memories and their archival connections to a tomorrow. 
Of course, this is to return history itself to another history, to return history itself to another history, and to cut the cord with, with the security of scientific neutrality as the guarantee of our language and knowledge. Here we can recognize in Greek colonization around the Mediterranean, not simply a seaborne empire or phallusocracy, but also the violent evidence of diaspora and exile from the Greek cities that inaugurated the colonial un undertaking 2,500 years ago. This opens a hole in time. This opens a hole in time, <clears throat> rendering that past proximate to contemporary concerns. Establishing an emporium, practicing colonization, disciplining the territory, according to a determined cultural order, experiencing, contesting, and absorbing hybridization were essential to the experience of Pestum some 2,500 years ago as they are today. This is to establish an archipelago that is not only, uh, that is not simply spatial and geographical, but also temporal, also temporal, and which allows us to island hop across time, seeking uh, through the undeniable singularities we encounter the communalities of an ongoing configuration that renders the past comprehensible to future endeavors. This is also to insist that the archaic and the past is not back there, safely locked away in a dead time, but constitutes the constellation of the present. So following uh, Antonio Gramsci, we could say this means to turn the relation between past and present, the archaic and modern, 180 degrees. So it's not like that, it's like that. Uh, so where the, uh, this is to recognize the repressed and the refused in the modern modalities of the subaltern. If a dive in the tomb is evidence of a migrating and hybridizing culture, Greek in southern Italy, bordering on and intermingling with Etruscan, Roman, and Lucanian, it also points us towards a migrating Mediterranean, a migrating Mediterranean. The latter clearly offered hospitality to many names in multiple directions. Phoenician, Greek, Carthaginian, Roman, Byzantine, Arab, Norman, Genoese, Venetian, Ottoman, France, Britain. To think with these terms and histories is once again to break open the archive and insist on a fluidity that overflows the terrestrial confines of what today is predominantly a national narration of this complex geohistory. Further, it is to bring to today's symposium our symposium, us, uh, inebriated with the determinist liquor of neoliberalism, deeper discussions that transform the question of modern migration from its uh, frequent marginalization in social economical terms to considering it as both the motor of Mediterranean cultures and of modernity itself. So if uh, what I'm suggesting here in some ways is mass migration is modernity. It is not something that occurs in the periphery or simply a phenomenon to be considered as a crisis tied to uh, push and pull factors of social and economical importance, but is actually central to the making of modernity and with it central to the making of the modern Mediterranean. So if mass migration is modernity, then the movement back and forth across Mediterranean waters, both south to north, what is occurring today, and north to south, is part of a common hubris, hubris driven by a transnational polit political economy and the worlding of the world by capital. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, the European population, this is the uh, French colony of Algeria, French, uh, the population of Algeria, the Ottoman province seized by France in 1830, um, was close to one million. One million Europeans. The majority were French, and there were large, uh, sizable components uh, of Spanish and Italians. Tunisia next door, to your right, uh, next door, had an Italian population of 100,000. While in Libya, another Ottoman territory invaded by Italy in 1911, had an Italian population that peaked in the 1930s at around 13% of the population, 13% of the population. And also, of course, the site for um, modernity. This is the uh, one of the hotels in Tripoli. Uh, so uh, inscribed in the very architecture, we have question of colonization, modernity, fascism, inscribed in the very language of the, of the occupation of urban space here, <coughs> as elsewhere, obviously. Um, so what is occurring today with migration towards the overdeveloped north of the planet is the latest episode in a very long narrative. Uh, from the transatlantic slave trade to contemporary migrations, there are clearly differences 
but also deep underlying continuities that could permit us to write the history of modernity as the history of migration and diasporas. Here questions of belonging cross our juridical, cultural, and historical borders with unanswered questions. The authorization of citizenship, the rights to narrate, the right to have rights, disturb and unwind existing political settlements. The co contemporary migrant becomes a critical cipher, the non-person whose practices and presence inserts a black hole in the narrative while consistently decoding the asymmetrical relations of power that orchestrate the violence of the presence. Here, for example, the connections between uh, Black Lives Matter and the Palestinian cause unveils a counter history, a counter history of a neoliberal order. This means to refuse to erase the populations that through their presence and survival expose the wounds and cuts on the body of modernity that the usual maps refuse to chart and indicate. Here, once again, registering modernity's necropolitics, we touch the depths, we touch the depths of naming today's Mediterranean a black Mediterranean. I hear I'm referring to the work which was already developed in the 1980s and 1990s by uh, critic, black critics and historians such as Cedric Robinson, uh, Robin Kelly, and more recently by Ashil, Ashil Bembe. <clears throat> So, Alora, as between plastic uh, debris, uh, ecological disasters, and bodies denied, rejected, and thrown away, we find ourselves undoing the premises that have, up until now, managed and explained the Mediterranean. Here, the refuse and the refuse of history survives and lives on, for example, uh, in the memories of art. Now, this would be a whole other talk. This is a, uh, a still from the uh, video installation that... Uh, uh, Ranji mentioned by Isaac Julian, Western Union Small Boats. This is the famous boat cemetery, it no longer exists, uh, on uh, Lampedusa, the Western Union Small Boats. And this would be a whole other talk. But it's just to register this way of following this uh, work, uh, artistic work, which, is, as I'm trying to say, is not simply artistic work. It's a cultural work, it's political work. It's a way of disseminating holes, puncturing the existing narrative, disseminating a set of questions, uh, would lead us also to help us to think about this unauthorized Mediterranean which persists and exists and resists. So this means uh, removing the Mediterranean from a single register. Respecting the complexity of its historical and cultural formation means not simply reintroducing denied stories and histories or opting for the other shore and pretending to be able to see the world from the subaltern perspective. It doesn't mean that. It means dismantling the assumptions of the knowledge and language that have brought us here. Dismantling that. Not to delete them, can't cancel historiography, sociology, archaeology, but to expose them. Not to delete them, but to expose them in another unauthorized configuration and to acquire a critical apprenticeship in speaking in the proximity of this emerging configuration. Now, what I want to do, uh, and then quickly, is um, let me briefly propose an example from contemporary historiography that proposes a critical choice. Um, and very different ethical and political directions. So if we take the historian uh, David uh, uh, Abulafia, his book, The Great Sea, A Human History of the Mediterranean, uh, we find on our hands a work of 800 pages that moves from the dawn of human activities to the present. In the preface, we encounter this affirmation. The Mediterranean, uh, I can't do this Oxford accent, but anyway, the Mediterranean we now know has, was shaped by Phoenicians, Greeks, and Etruscans in antiquity, by Genoese, Venetians, and Catalans in the Middle Ages, by Dutch, English, and Russian navies in the centuries before 1800. This is the preface to uh, the Great Sea, a human history of the Mediterranean. In this frame of the Mediterranean, once we've, we've removed the Phoenicians, uh, all the protagonists are Occidental. The Arab Berber world and that of the Ottomans has been expelled from the picture. Africa and Asia have been removed. This is the history of the Mediterranean from you know, 10,000 years ago, right through to the present. But are we sure about that? As a provocation, we might ask, how is it possible to concentrate almost exclusively on the northern shore and carefully avoid how European powers have actually produced and unilaterally managed the spatial temporal syntax 
of the Mediterranean in recent centuries. Operating with the universalizing grammar of disciplinary neutrality that sustains a teleological narrative of progress, progress, we are left with an abstract idea of human history. This is a history that is immune to the problematic comprehension, to the problematic comprehension of modernity that is violently con constituted through colonization, colonialism, imperialism, the formation of the modern nation state, and the complex and deeply racialized categories uh, of the history and the human. The implication in this account, notwithstanding the density of empirical detail, is the reconfirmation of the status quo, in which geopolitics are translated into historical premises and vice versa. On the right, the, uh, in his account of the city of Salonika under the Ottomans and beyond, the historian Mark uh, Matsuver talks of the world concentrated in the monotheisms, the monotheisms of the Mediterranean, those religions of the desert, Judaism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that developed in transcultural diffusion. The history of Salonika emerges from a montage of intertwined narratives that speak in terms of pauses, breaks, intervals, and oblivion. His history concludes in the actual Greek city of uh, Thessaloniki. Here we encounter the ruins and cancellation of the historical, cultural, political, and religious composition of an urbane Ottoman world, and the violent imposition of Hellenic nationalism, and then Turkish, aided and favored by fascism. Even in 1925, uh, the Muslim population of the city was exchanged with the Greek one in Anatolia, the famous population swap. <coughs> Uh, between 1943 and 1945, the Nazis exterminated a 60,000 Sephardic Jewish population of the city in the death camps of Eastern Europe. Alongside the terrible cost of ethnic cleansing, already encouraged by the push for national homogeneity, lies the importance that is announced in the title of Masova's study, City of Ghosts, City of Ghosts. The refusal to remember the refusal to remember is as significant as the official insistence on conserving a historical continuity based on oblivion. As Freud understood visiting the ruins of Imperial Rome, such sedimented sites of memory, now exposed to what has been negated, refused, and consigned to silence, render our knowledge, explanations, and management of the world vulnerable, susceptible to doubt, entangled in interrogation and interpretation. What was that? Okay. It's precisely about naming the anonymous and directing us towards the semantic insistence of silence that the once illegal Ethiopian migrant Dagmawi, Dagmawi Yima, who is now Italian, uh, does in his beautiful short film of 2014, Asmat, names and memory of all victims of the sea. You can see this, uh, you can go on the uh, on internet and Vimeo and find this video, it's a short video, it's very beautiful. <clears throat> Once again, we are interrogated by a liquid archive, but the bodies suspended in its waters, the questions that they carry sustained in the waters of the Mediterranean. A liquid archive, a maritime epistemology that confronts, uh, that confronts and confutes the coordinates and we're used to uh, we used to apply uh, and permit us to chart other histories, chart other histories of the present. So I'm going to now, uh, I want to leave you uh, with a suggestion prompted by the movement of music and the refusal of language to represent a single version of the modern Mediterranean. So it's to deal, uh, think about language and music in terms of opacity. Um, the challenge of the opacity of language always carries us beyond uh, our existing understandings and uh, authorizations. So, in a very banal way, simply to recall that the principal uh, spoken language in the Mediterranean, in all its variants and dialects, is Arabic. Nobody is, or perhaps you speak some Arabic, right? <laughs> nobody, uh, usually uh, when I give this sort of talk, nobody speaks Arabic. So it's Arabic. So this is already to engage with other coordinates, other coordinations, other coordinates, you know? Uh, to listen to this language in a sound 
irreducible to our immediate uh, registered sense is to reroute the Mediterranean, its historical formation and present configurations, to reroute that through other maps, and there register the productive limits, the productive limits of our position, knowledge, and voice, while listening close by, in the vicinity. So I'm not going to play you. Uh, it's last. Do I have time? Five minutes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm going to play you a piece by uh, this fantastic uh, Palestinian singer and oud player, uh, Camilla Joubran. Just leave it as a question. You think about the sound. Uh, she sings in Arabic, um, clearly, uh, and it's sort of modern Arabic music. So it's reworking the tradition, transforming it in a way that it encounters contemporary coordinates of being a, a modern uh, woman from Palestine living in the Mediterranean. Um, leave it as a question. So it's a, suspended in the sound um, are a series of interrogations, which perhaps we cannot answer, uh, but we can register them, and that registers the limits of who we think we are as we map, manage, define what we consider to be our modernity, and with it, our Mediterranean.
Talk was an excuse to get to this. <laughs> Though, the, is is that in the same place? Yeah, it's the, it's so, the size of the. But the, the these are. I mean, I don't know if they would have been seen as white bodies, but these are very different yeah. from the divers' bodies. Sure, exactly. So, yeah. what's the um, What I'm asking is yeah. is ignorance. What's the relation between the bodies? Well, they don't know. This is the answer. They don't know. So the, the thing is, the hypothesis is that this may have been a slave, right? Uh -huh. Maybe a slave. Or otherwise, but it could also be a question of class, right? Uh, that uh, these are Greek citizens, uh, yes. and this may he, he may also be Greek, but somebody's you know rural, rural laborer or whatever, working all day in the sun under in the fields or whatever. So we don't. They just don't know. They don't know. But uh, what is is intriguing is yeah, the color coding compared to how we'd like to code the Hellenic, Hellenic antique world uh, with uh, Brad Pitt as Achille. as Achille. So, I mean, it's, yeah, we don't, they don't know. I mean, are there any other examples that they He's, have discovered? That's like the only example of a diver that actually exists in all the tombs, both uh, Greek tombs and Etruscan tombs, is figured. But there's many other tombs, paint, they're all painted. But you can see them in Pestum, elsewhere. Inside. Yeah, on the inside. They're for, they're accompany, accompany the dead to the other side, the elsewhere. And uh, as they're basically, I mean, there's a friend of ours, you probably may have heard him, Paul Carter, this Australian sure. uh, sort of cult, uh, culture, well, he's, how can I put it, historian, historian of space, really. But I mean, he's written a book on it, the art of the invisible, the art of the invisible, which develops this whole perspective from the tomb of the diver. Uh, I, I suppose, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about um, this question of the Mediterranean and historical time um, and whether, um, I mean, of course, you know, the, the text, the text that I think of in terms of the Mediterranean and historical time is Brodel's work, of course, and sort of the, 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 the development of the Annals school um, 
uh, the idea of the long durée. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious about whether you think that there is something specific to the Mediterranean um, that uh, demands of, uh, of the historian a rethinking of time, that the, the, time, the time of history that for whatever reason is dominant at the moment in which people are writing does not seem wholly adequate um, to, to the task of, uh, of thinking the Mediterranean. Um, so, I mean, yeah, so it's, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's, are we on? Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's a gigantic. That's a you know a gigantic yeah. question because it's basically raising questions about the whole historiographical operation, and it's true that Brodeur uses a term of um, much longer space, uh, longer flow of time, uh, but I think it still uh, tends to operate with uh, within an idea of what I call linearity mm -hmm. um, in a sort of a chronology of events which may require longer time. But I think one can work with Brodeur, uh, insist on this idea of deep time, um, but the deep time then becomes that, the folding, yes. because yeah. the argument being made here is about, you know, the historical graph operation is always uh, anachronistic, even though historians would never agree because they insist that somehow uh, establishing, identifying the documents, you somehow can get back in time to that moment, even though you can never fully uh, reveal it. Um, and I think, um, I think the argument you made here is also that time and space, uh, well, time is space, space mm -hmm. is time. So it's to think about, I suppose, uh, without um, being too pretentious about, you know, the quantum physics <laughs> encourages us to think about, and also not simply quantum physics. I'm thinking, obviously, when I'm trying to think about the Mediterranean is uh, also inspired by, I don't know, the critical work of people like uh, Walter Benjamin, to think about it in terms of critical constellation. So the past is past in one way, but the, the elements in the past, which may be stars, planets, are also continue to illuminate our present. And it may be a, a moving constellation. We move through time, space, all the time, but, and the constellation changes. But it's never actually cancelled. It can never be reduced to a simple uh, reductive um, chronology of events or a simple uh, linearity. Um, and of course, these are questions which I think, uh, it's not true of all historians, but I think it's, let's say history as its practice uh, as an institutional disciplinary practice tends not to take into consideration. It really does believe in the idea of rendering time to be rendered transparent to the historian's gaze. Uh, and I think, um, so the Mediterranean becomes important for me because it is a very complex space, you know. It is the meeting of three continents. Um, it is a space in between, Mediterranean, uh, and it has a very rich <laughs> and complicated cultural uh, and historical formation. And I think it, that, uh, and of course, of course, it's tied to the fact I live there, right? So it's about living, thinking about the location of the voice, what authorizes you to speak and stuff. And um, I never took on thinking about the Mediterranean until I'd lived in, uh, in its space and time which is a different temporality, I can assure you, particularly southern Italy from here or northern Europe. Uh, for, I didn't feel I could say anything about it until I lived there for at least 20 years. But then I felt I had to somehow rework my uh, training, mm -hmm. I don't know that's the word, in cultural and, in cultural and post-colonial studies uh, in a way which engaged with where I, was, where I found myself, mm -hmm. of teaching, working, and thinking. Um, and the Mediterranean, of course, is, uh, as I said, a very d deep... Uh, complicated uh, formation, uh, and it, uh, so it allowed me to raise these questions about history, uh, whose history, who, and of course that ties in with the whole question of post-colonial studies, thinking about the subaltern. In fact, the, uh, the um, director of the Museum of Pestum, this uh, young German uh, director, uh, Gabriel Zutriegel, uh, he's written a book on subalternity in the ancient world, and mm -hmm. his, his work is about that, mm -hmm. uh, which of course in classical archaeology or classical history of the antique world, is, it tends to be less considered, though that's, that's changing. Mm. So uh, I think it's, um, it's also that idea of uh, how, how to rethink uh, the Mediterranean both before, through, and after colonialism, uh, and how to draw upon these other maps, uh, other voices, other languages, which force us to, to break apart uh, the whole sort of geopolitical understandings, area studies, this idea of neutral sciences, which apparently are able to we're assured, able to explain and manage and determine what the Mediterranean is. And how, of course, the Mediterranean, particularly thinking from the sea, from a, a maritime, a floating, more floating or offshore perspective, 
frustrates all that. Yeah. And so I'm interested in that. It frustrates that desire for, a, for a transparency and the will to power. Uh, and also historically, uh, as I tried to suggest by, um, I suppose, criticizing the book by David uh, Abulafia, mm -hmm. um, how can you talk about the Mediterranean uh, without ignoring the whole centrality of Islam? Islam, mm -hmm. believe it or not, is a European religion. Okay? <laughs> Islam has been present in Europe since 732. I was saying to Larry yesterday, it's, uh, it's been present in Europe much longer in certain parts of Europe than Christianity in other parts of Europe. Mm -hmm. Frederick II founded the Order of the Teutonic Knights, well, initially to protect pilgrims going to Jerusalem, the Holy Land, but that was a failed project because the Holy Land had already been reconquered by the Kurdish leader, Saladin. But uh, eventually, I mean, the, the Teutonic Knights, their job, if you like, their military uh, the use of military-wise was to conquer the pagan lands around the Baltic Sea, mm -hmm. and so and you also had like up until the 11th century uh, in Sweden, Uppsala, human sacrifice every seven years um, for you know the spring rites. Uh, uh, whereas you had Islam present uh, already for 300 years, 400 years in another part of Europe, mm -hmm. uh, and just as Spain expels in four, 1492 uh, the Jews and the Muslim population from Spain. Of course, there's a whole Islamic population elsewhere in Europe, in the Balkans, right? Already established by the power and presence of the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire, in 1600, was considered by all the European courts as the most powerful power in Europe. In Europe, not outside, in Europe. So those questions, you know, raised just from a banal historical archive, uh, they pose very... Uh, uncomfortable questions to the idea of simply the Mediterranean as ours, the same way as modern modernity is ours to uh, legislate and for and to, uh, uh, to manage. Uh, so I, I, um, I think this obviously is tied to a whole idea of a transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary studies, which of course are very difficult to pursue. Uh, I don't know here, but in Italy it's very difficult to pursue because of very strong uh, lobbies which manage disciplines and uh, exclude any idea of uh, contamination by uncomfortable questions of his type. But I think, you know, critical works about that, right? Disseminating uncomfortable questions. Mm -hmm. Inducing crisis. <laughs> Larry, okay, yes, Larry. go for it. <laughs> yes, yeah. Mm. This is an ongoing, we've had conversations for decades, so yeah. you all should feel, uh, mm -hmm. three, Names came to my mind listening to you. Uh, well, actually four, Rodell was one. And pick any you want, you might have some comments on. Um, one is Leo Strauss, who without knowing it, of course, sort of, I mean, maybe he did, locates the origins of the, Orient, of the Occident in the Mediterranean, Athens versus Jerusalem, Yeah. right? Uh, the other is, uh, now we're going, we're moving further and further right. Carl Schmidt, yeah, sure. uh, land, land and sea, and uh, nomos of the earth. Carl Schmidt. Mm -hmm. Don't like to reference fascist philosophers, but you know. Sometimes they. Sometimes to think they with. do yes, have to yes. be. Um, and the the last one, because of the kind of aquatic um, thematics and and methods that you're advocating, is Zygmunt Bauman. Yeah. And mm -hmm. his notions of liquidity yeah. and liquid modernity. And uh, I just wondered if you had any comments on one, two, three? Well, yeah, of course, all those, all those uh, <laughs> authorities, those authorities you quote, of course. Well, they're uh, just good writers. Well, they are authorities, you know, uh, you quote. I've, uh, I think, you know, I've, of course, I'm aware of, I've, I've transversed, transferred, uh, transversed uh, their, their work. Uh, I mean, I'm surprised you suggest, uh, also mentioned Heidegger. Uh, and I think all these writers uh, here, are, are, uh, well, I think that's important because I think these writers, uh, as Levinas said when speaking of Heidegger, and the same you could say of Leo Strauss or Carl Schmitt, uh, you have to sort of go through them to get away from them in a way. You have to work through them to get away from them. You can't ignore them. It's like I was trying to say, you can't cancel the intellectual disciplinary heritage you have, but you can expose it, render it vulnerable. And so, yeah, I mean, but the whole thing about Athens and Jerusalem, of course, is still operating very much in a sort of, uh, it's still tied very much to the northern shore. And of course, you open up that archive, like, you know, the, the whole idea of Greek philosophy begins. But actually, where does it begin? The first philosophy was actually on the Asian shore in the, uh, in the Greek, uh, um, 
in the sort of Greek diaspora. Um, uh, so, and then the, the much, you know, the questions raised by people like Martin Bernal, you know, the African Asian uh, origins of, and of course there are no origins. You never get to point zero and say it began here. And so I think that's, that already opens up a much more uncomfortable space, archival space, um, which you can't really say it began here. The parable of the West begins in Athens and, or Jerusalem and then develops through, uh, through the course of European history. And I think you understand, you know, it leads to the whole thing also of understanding how Europe is so, peri Europe in many ways, so peripheral to what we're talking about when we talk about the Mediterranean, at least up until 1300, 1400, it was very much in the periphery of the so-called civilized world. So those people are important. Uh, Carl Schmidt, of course, you know, and uh, re-elaborating, uh, if you say, the importance there, uh, thinking of the centrality of the sea uh, to the uh, colonial enterprise, which uh, I think is very important, you know, and he was anticipated by Admiral Nelson, right? He who controls the seas controls the world. Uh, 1800s. So I think those those uh, voices are are, are important, but I, I'm not. Uh, I, it's also partly I'm interested in this thing. What I mentioned briefly is the idea of a post scholarly, mm -hmm. post scholarly uh, appropriation, understanding, elaboration of uh, an inheritance which is critical, disciplinary, cultural, historical. Your position, positionality, uh, also rendering that more vulnerable to a style of uh, exposition and writing. Uh, which um, is not simply respecting, you know, MLA style sheets, the footnotes, all that. I mean, well, I think it's important to recognize because I have friends in the Arab world who just think it's, uh, it's a real tyranny and it's a form of colonialism. They have to suffer in order to appear in an intellectual discourse which is hegemonized by, you know, North Atlantic. <laughs> so I think you know these things are important, and uh, and of course I'm working with all that inheritance, um, but I'm I'm working with it in a slightly uh, undisciplined, indisciplined fashion, which I think as part of the heritage of cultural studies, right? <laughs> <laughs> Although it's been squashed, I know, but anyway, <laughs> living on, surviving. <laughs> So, so some of us have been reading Land and Sea, actually right. the the Schmidt. Um, text this semester, which does strike me as being um, quite different from the nomos of, of, yeah. of the earth in the right. sense that, um, you know, it's a far more peculiar text. <laughs> um, uh, it, it really is trying to think about the question of the elemental yeah. um, sure. in different ways. And it, it, it does, um, I mean, I was thinking, I was thinking through that with the question of the of um, of the the rhythm um, of both your talk, in fact, and um, and the the music that we have at the end, the, the elemental um, in in the in the Schmidt text does take us to a different kind of sure. temporal framework for the sea than 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 in that of the land. Um, with that real focus on the elemental, um, whereas the nomos of the earth, I mean, fascinating, and it, it's fascinating, terrifying, whatever, um, uh, in, its, in its own way is very much more a text of, uh, of legal theory um, and political theory uh, and uh, a switch away from the friend-enemy distinction to this sort of larger nomos. So, so I mean, I, 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 I'm interested in sort of thinking about the differences there and maybe as a way of sort of getting into this question of, of the elemental um, a little bit um, because it, it does seem as if uh, the element of water has also been um, been, if you like, the the inspiration or the medium for some of those other texts that you were citing: um, the Cedric Robinson, the uh, Sadia Hartman, uh, Christina Sharp. Um, who else was it? Um, Fred Moten. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, is there? I don't know what the question is. I don't want to make it as sort of boring as is there something well, specific about the aquatic. But I mean, so Heidegger would yeah. seem to connect to the elemental. Yeah. Right. right, yes. Although yeah. it may be uh. more Bachelardian to think about water 
Right. Because for Heidegger, right, it's nice. the solidity mm. right, in the sense of the earth, whereas Bachelard has perhaps a, a more fluid sure. mm-hmm. sense of the possi- elemental possibilities. Mm. But Although think, there's all the river stuff with yeah. the Heidegger. Yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there is, but it's all yeah. like, mm, not quite controlling the same. it. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. sure. Yes. <laughs> I won't get into that. But listen, uh, I think one of the things that emerged from your observations is... Um, is this idea of somehow trying to undo uh, the linearity of explanation. Mm. So it's not simply about linearity and sort of how history is often presented as in terms of chronological accumulation of events. But in terms of the linearity of explanation, which you know, raises very uh, important questions, I think, about understanding the limits of our language, mm-hmm. uh, both academically and in disciplinary terms. Because, you know, the organization of language is... But we know that the um, experience, what it, how it, the Mediterranean, how modernity, how life is lived, is not lived in that single uh, rhythm. Uh, so I mean, the idea of multiple rhythms, uh, the idea of uh, an order of knowledge, or orders of knowledge which cannot be reduced to the linearity of an explanation, whether it's the written or what you do on the computer. Um, and I think uh, those questions, all I'm trying to suggest in many ways is to register those questions, those limits, uh, in the orders of knowledge, proposing there are other orders of knowledge, mm-hmm. uh, which, for example, the contemporary visual arts, particularly those visual arts which are considered to be post-colonial, or, yeah. or musics, different musics, are proposing other orders of knowledge. They're not simply illustrations or expressions of a historical moment or a cultural formation, but are themselves proposing another way of being in time and place, mm-hmm. another way of being in time and place, which uh, the existing... Uh, I don't know, sociology of music or the history of art often uh, fails to register because it's seeking to order and render transparent to a particular set of disciplinary premises what it's talking about, Mm -hmm. uh, reducing them to objects. And um, there are subjectivating forces, uh, other orders of knowledge. I think Mm -hmm. that's how I'd reply to that without getting uh, drawn into some technical discussion about Carl Schmidt or Heidegger in, mm. the, in the forest as opposed, mm. I don't know. So I think that's, that's what right. I'm intrigued by. Right. Um, it's about registering the limits, or the limits of, of orders of knowledge by, through registering other orders of knowledge which are not registered, understood as orders of knowledge. Mm. They're considered mm. entertainment or what you do in your free time. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet there's doing something more, something much more. Mm-hmm. So we're, also the idea of histories and cultures which are sustained and suspended uh, both in the vision and in sound. Um, that continue to pose questions, interrogations, which more institutionalized versions of knowledge cannot hear, see, Mm -hmm. listen, dance to, whatever. Mm -hmm. It it does seem also like there's a... uh, uh, There's a kind of aesthetics of the lament, right? Certainly that, I mean, with Christina Sharp, obviously it's the idea of the the wake is very important. Um, uh, I don't know about this particular Oud piece, but it certainly sounds like a lament um, uh, of of some sort. And, you know, I'm, I, I suppose I'm, I'm I'm trying to think a little bit about the relationship between uh, in um, in 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 the in the aesthetics that you've been interested in in the aquatic and the lament. Um, I mean, certainly those texts about the Atlantic right. are tied to the lament. Um, and I'm trying to. I'm just trying to think about what, what the, what's different. I mean, I suppose. Hmm. I mean, it, what what is the terra centric lament? Is it is it the eulogy? Is it you know? Is it something quite different? I mean, I'm I'm just I'm just I I know that you're not specifically talking about the lament. But it is about a different kind of. It seems like a, a, about a, 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 a form of remembering yeah. that is um, closer to the lament than an account of historical teleology, as it sure. were, or even a genealogy, in fact. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I think. Um, the, last, the music we heard by uh, Camila Joubran, um, 
I think it's important to sort of recognize it's, uh, this idea, as you say, is about proposing a lament, if you like. I mean, the music she plays, or the songs she sings, are all, uh, they're all poetry. They're all written by poets, Arab, contemporary Arab poets, and then yeah. she puts them to music. Um, I think it's, one can consider it in terms of these archives and bodies that are not recognized, yeah. not registered by, uh, and that's how I tend to listen to it. Of course, yeah. that's, you know, the limits also of my, of my understanding of it. But uh, I think what's important here is, is this idea of uh, the music, um, the Arab music, the maquam, uh, the scales that are used, which are very different from uh, Occidental music uh, making, uh, like the blues, um, they are. It's very much about improvised, improvised mm. music. So it's about improvisation. Mm. It's about using uh, elements that are available in circulation, and the whole music is improvised. It's not following a set a set score or a linear development through time, as we have to have. Whether it's a pop song or a sonata, you know, a linear development of the music. It's very much about, it begins, and who knows where it's going to. So there's a repetition, and the repetition, and each repetition, there's an addition, there's a, something happens. Uh, it's not, never the same. It's a changing same, as it were, uh, which leads you into a very different uh, space, both musically, culturally, and I think historically. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. So it's not simply about, and it's not simply about being a, a metaphor for yeah. a, a counter history or a yeah. counter rhythm or counter rhythms or different ways of sounding out modernity. I think it's more than that. It's about the materiality of other ways of being in time and, mm -hmm. time and being, mm -hmm. time and space. Um, uh, and um, so registering that, I have to register certain limits, uh, limits mm -hmm. cultural, historical, cultural, and political limits of how I understand the Mediterranean and modernity. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So I think, uh, mm -hmm. and I guess, I guess also it's also insisting that uh, po <coughs> poetics, poetics is political. So, uh, you know, again, it's not something that she's added to the real history which is occurring in the economy or in the public sphere, public right. political sphere, but it's actually, it is proposing all the time a critical opening, a critical way of articulating the present, which takes us into less guaranteed spaces, mm -hmm. uh, rendering us all vulnerable to unanswered questions and questions which do not merely mirror our interests, our concerns, our desires. Mm -hmm. Lydia Carty uh, is Honorary Professor of English Studies at the University of Naples Orientale. She's a cultural critic and a feminist and co-founder of the research group Feminist Futures at the Center for Postcolonial and Gender Studies. Among her publications are Female Stories, Female Bodies, more show and tell, um, La Voce dell'Altra, The Voice of the Other, um, excuse my accent, and the co-editorship of the post-colonial question, which I mentioned before. And her more recent interest in Italian diasporic literature, migration and artistic practices and female genealogies in feminist contemporary theory have been elaborated in such essays as transcultural itineraries, voices of a minor empire, literary citizenship, migrating belongings, and towards a ten tentacular coexistence, speculative fictions, and feminist futures. Um, Lydia um, uh, has worked on a variety of different media and, um, and genre. Um, and uh, the book, Female Stories, Female Bodies, is, um, is a book that actually does cover a number of different media and really takes very seriously the, um, the, world, the different kinds of world-making capacities of the, various, of, of, the, of, the, of the various media that she explores. Um, taking on um, that idea of world-making through thinking about the different kinds of ideas of uh, experience, space, time that is embodied in each one of those. Um, She's also, uh, in, in, in her work um, on television um, uh, from the 80s, um, uh, maybe, maybe before, but from the work on television that I know from the 80s, she also draws attention to um, the way in which the, the scholarly analysis of, 
of, of television is really sort of um, uh, fascinated by the banalities of television, as it were, um, the, the, the poorest quality of television as well, the kind of obsession um, of a return to um, uh, 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 Dallas and um, in the in in the in the in the British context, crossroads. You know the kind of the 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 um, uh, the forms of television. It's almost like the study of television is interested most in its in in its most um, uh, in its lowest form, as it were. Um, uh, she also, um, in, in that early work on television that I think is just, is, is so interesting, she also points to uh, and predicts a conversation in feminist studies that I think would be, that becomes much more important later on. Um, and that is around the question of translation. Um, and and something like the 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 understanding of of a term like genre for feminist theory across borders more generally. So this is something that happens really quite early um, in her work. In, for example, um, a, a contemplation of um, of the question of the word genre itself. Right, whether we're thinking about a biological genre in the sense of gender, um, uh, a human genre, uh, um, a species genre in the sense of kind, um, uh, a grammatical genre um, uh, even. And you know, these are questions that some people think um, uh, um, only happened uh, um, after the publication and translation of, of such texts as Gender Trouble by, by Judith Butler, but in fact they were urgent questions prior to that. Um, and, uh, and I think Lydia really um, uh, did some important work in sort of thinking about the ways in which the question of translation happens in, um, in, in, uh, in feminist thought, in feminist theory, to try to think about different kinds of registers of language, but also different orders of being as well, from techne, thesis, nomos, physis, um, across the artistic, literary, and um, uh, poetic genres, as it were. Um, she's also um, uh, uh, written with Ian on the question of the Mediterranean, um, particularly interested there also in questions of um, of uh, uh, um, the site of contemporary Italy and the question of translation as it plays out there too. Um, uh, and I, I, I would, if she's not going to talk about that today, I would love it if we could have, have uh, something of a conversation about that. Um, and then the recent work that I, I just mentioned on transcultural itineraries um, in uh, women's literature of migration in Italy has really um, uh, um, addressed the way in which writing produced by women migrants um, uh, in Italian um, uh, is transforming the language of uh, is transform transforming Italian. Um, uh, that that there's there's a, a way in which there is a kind of um, uh, a relocation, if you like, of the of the of of of, of the language that she um, understands as having a kind of longer history than than simply. Uh, changing it right today but actually sort of goes back to to the to the longer history um of italian that we might understand partly in relation to the question of the gramscian question of the southern question um also okay i'm going to stop talking now um her talk today is diasporic female narratives crossing the mediterranean rewriting italy <laughs> Thank you very much to Ranjana Kanna for this introduction. And uh, I thank her and the Institute and Sarah Rogers for the invitation and for the hospitality that this Institute is offering me. <coughs> As you can see, you see here uh, a clip from a film by uh, Shirin Neshat, an Iranian filmmaker and artist. And uh, I would call it uh, Women at Sea. The, the, the film is called Rapture. 
but uh, uh, I would call it women at the sea. You see, waiting like birds on, on the shore, and then finally getting it. Certainly, the boat is very small, isn't it? And we'll be speaking about the boats. Women at sea. First of all, I want to say that I do not intend to speak for or to speak about women at sea. As Asia Dieba recommended about speaking about women in the Algerian Revolution, I am trying to be to speak beside, on the side of, as Triminha said, nearby, echoing Asia Debar, they spoke very much in similar terms in the same year, 1882. Diasporic narratives move among different cultures, histories, languages. One, the example I want to give today is given by the voices of Afro-diasporic women in Italy, who are all part of Mediterranean, who is now crossed by contemporary transversal routes. Um, mostly they come from the Horn of Africa, though not all, but those I'll, I'll be uh, touching on are from the Horn of Africa, from Eastern Africa, which was the site of uh, Italian colonialism. Contrary to what normally uh, is thought of, it was not coinciding with the fascist regime, the 20 years of the fascist regime, but it started with the neoliberal state at the end of the 19th century. And, uh, and uh, so at those time, no, no suspicion of fascism. Then of course it thrived and was enhanced through the fascist regime and ended with the Second World War. Their link with the original tradition is neither visible nor transparent or easily traced. Their belonging to a single culture never really established. Our migration and exile in a poetical leap reflecting conscious and unconscious tones, they recall both material conditions and symbolic aspects. As Ranjana said already, I want to stress that of course it was, it is, a, re a reversal of knowledge as we know it, and here yeah, I'm quoting Sylvia Winter's words, uh, but it's also a reversal of languages. They register a presence in many different fields, novels, um, poetry, visual art, and also media, music, and journalism. They are also political activists. There was one a few days ago here who is both a writer and a political activist, Ijaba Shego. Um, they choose to write in a minor language, but renew its modes and moods by placing themselves outside the forms of institutional literary tradition and breaking the boundaries of genre, disciplines, and cultures. Even within the same national border, they inhabit a hybrid space, both inside and outside. Most of these writers, and especially those from the Horn of Africa, as I said, reveal another view of Italian colonialism. They feel a void in official records by recalling invasions, massacres, concentration camps, and last but not least, the infamous racial laws of the Italian colonial regime. Along, of course, with the brutal banalities of authoritarian rule. They contribute to the knowledge of the Sorry. They contribute to the knowledge of, uh, uh, of an Italian colonial past, creating a rupture in the vision of a homogeneous white Italy, more European than Mediterranean. They offer a look on ourselves and pose the question of how to shape our identity as Italians after colonialism, accepting, for instance, that surprising surprise, we are post-colonial subjects. We, are post -colonial, we have a post-colonial identity, which, of course, Till very recent times, every Italian would deny. Totally. Colonia, post-colonia, what have got to do with that? It is British imperialism, American racism, etc., etc., what have we got to do with it? 
They also recall a mourning for a loss that Italian history and culture have not addressed. In this, the Italians are not alone, as a similar amnesia is common in other forms to other forms of Occidental colonialism. Paul Gilroy has again argued this for British imperialism. Tony Morrison or Octavia Butler, among others, among many others, for slavery in the United States. Ranjana Khan has evocatively written on post-colonial melancholy in dark continents as a path for utopian futures. In fact, spurring me to get interested recently on Afrofuturism, feminist Afrofuturism, because of this movement from the past to the present to the future. In the novels by these writers, the shores of the Mediterranean are co-present. The writing uh, uh, is a sort of liquidity and moves between two shores in the wake of ghostly traces, a kind of emotional and wandering geography. In fact, in parentheses, I don't have time to talk about it, the Adriatic shores on the eastern part of Italy, they also are present because of the Almadian Yugoslavian, which was once Yugoslavia, Yugoslavian uh, migrants, Italian writers from there. There are some, but it is a parenthesis. On each side, there is always the ghost of the other. On each side, on each coast, sure, there is always the ghost of the other in the, in the forms of hope and aspiration or of regret and nostalgia, a movement back and forward in time and space along migration routes. The descriptions of the material journey of the passage from the country of origin to the Sicilian coast uh, are frequent in such narratives. In her novel Libera, Feven Abraha Tekle, a fugitive from Eritrea, has narrated over sea voyage to Sicily with its dangers and risks, the crossing from Tripoli to Lampedusa reminds her of another passage, though there are, of course, many obvious differences still. That is what she says. We spent the day sitting on the, on the dirty and stinking deck. Somewhere I had read that two centuries earlier, the slave ships, those used to carry the slaves to America, were surrounded by a strong smell impossible to escape. You could smell it in the distance. On that boat, it was the same thing. As I say, with many differences, not only the scape, uh, the, the space, <laughs> the difference in space, of course, the Mediterranean is a ditch in comparison with, uh, with the Atlantic, but also because, of course, the, 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 the black bodies in that passage, they had money value. The black bodies in the Mediterranean today, they have a different value within the neo-capitalist frame. The Somali Italian writer Ali Farah, in the novel Madre Piccola, describes the migration journey, firstly the crossing of the desert, that you can read here, too long for me to read, uh, which is as, as bad as what comes after in the crossing of the sea, of course and uh, precisely maybe because of the lack of water, you know. And then the shipwreck in the Sicilian channel. I hear people shouting and shouting for the fear of dying. I'm bound, sorry, sorry, this is the next one. I'm, re I'm reading the desert crossing. Secular stories of poor people. No, sorry, something wrong. Sorry. So you can see here, uh, I have used a few uh, slides from Isaac Julian's Western Union, small boats. It's a, a media installation that both uh, Ranjana before and Ian this morning have uh, described and talked about. Um, anyway, now I am back to Ali Farah, Madre Piccola. Secular story of poor people moved by desire. A desire so strong as to be able to unearth roots, to challenge cyclones. Desire is a very important stress, a very important element in this, uh, in this uh, uh, mission of migration. Not only hunger, not only needs, not only political persecutions, but also desire, desire for the elsewhere. 
you know, to die, sorry, I lost the, to die dehydrated, gasp for breath, trash about is not a trifle. I could imagine the boats in bad conditions and the list of objects found in the bank, in the bank. Small bag, copy book, picture, leather shoe, biberon, shirt, rucksack, watch, lace, details that write a history. Sea and desert reappear in many video, uh, in many video uh, works, visual and uh, uh, video works. First of all, as I have already said, uh, Isaac Julian, as it has already been said, that this is making the, the drowning. And uh, this is uh, one of the white sea rocks on Lampedusa. And this is uh, the cemetery of boats that Ian showed before. So I, won't, I will shortly go back to this. It is much larger than in this shot. It, uh, it covers part of the island because of many uh, wrecked boats. They are kept the relics just like that because they don't know what to do with it, you know. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, not only, but there is also a museum of the, the objects that you have just uh, seen listed in Ali Farah's uh, uh, book, novel. And uh, there is a, a museum of, uh, organized by Giacomo Sferlazzo. This morning, when Ian showed himself speaking on the beach, Giacomo Sferlazzo is a local intellectual and, uh, uh, and also the organizer of this museum. Uh, the, the, the leader of a group, really, only. It is, the group is very large. And they have put up uh, an object, a museum with the object of the, of the relics of the, the shipwrecks. There are diaries, there are this, everything. I can't stop on this. And uh, um, Isaac Julian's uh, work is now present in Rochester and in New York just these days with his... 10 videos installation on Frederick Douglass. The Sicilian channel, though, is only one of these channels uh, of these uh, southern theaters of migration. Sorry, I went too quickly. Uh, the Franco-Algerian artist, Zineb Sedira, uh, she's done this video uh, uh, film installation called Floating, uh, Floating Coffins which is what the boats were, the wrecked boat that you have just seen in the other installation. And she has done it uh, on the coast of Mauritania, because it is about a different journey, still a Mediterranean journey, but a different journey, um, possibly from, uh, from the North African shore to, to Spain, possibly. Um, and... Uh, The coast of Mauritania, she says, the desert meets the sea uh, in a space for abandoned and wrecked ships. And uh, again, we have a sort of graveyard, but at the same time, a source for survival. You can see here the opening up of hope in these cemeteries. The sea, like the desert, is a contested zone that links and separates, a screen onto which the imagination is projected. And imagination can be the way out. The space for hope was also in, in Neshat's clips you saw at the beginning, because the women actually make it to go to cross the sea. In both cases, sorry, here, you see this uh, androgynous figure looking at the wrecked ships. And here, going back to Isaac Julian, you see this other witness. There are two witnesses. The first one is probably Algerian, African, you know. Or the second one is a Jamaican actress that, uh, that uh, as a witness, Isaac puts in all his videos. These two, of course, are just witnesses from another re recalling other kinds of colonialism, other kinds of oppressions and racism. Um, now I come to you know the, the novel I give most more attention to, which is by Gabriella Germandi, 
an, Italian, uh, an Ethiopian Italian writer and performer, and she's the author of Regina di Fiori and di Perle. The poetical epigraph you read here is at the beginning of the book and says, I gather flower and pearls, flowers of all kinds, large, small, invisible, anonymous, fragrant flowers and flowers whose second set, scent tells stories to the soul and then concludes is a longer poem. I gather flowers and pearls from the enchanted garden of my land. The heroine of this novel, Mallet, is given the task to pass on the memory of Ethiopian colonial history, giving a counter history of the Italian conquest with its iniquity and violence. And this task will make her able to become her people's griot. She will cross the sea and carry it to the land of the Italians to destroy their possibility of forgetting. They, the venerable eld eldest of the house, always told me as a child, one day you will be our storyteller. One day you will cross the sea and take our histories with you to the land of the Italians to deprive them of the possibility to forget. And so, she concludes, that is why I'm telling you this story that is also mine, but yours as well, which of course is the the road to the future, whenever in future we may accept that this is our story as well. The memories of the strenuous resistance by the local patriots, which went from 1934 in Ethiopia to 1941, this is never spoken about, never told, and here there is a very precise history of the resistance on the mountains, in the forest, are intermingled with the tale of her growing up in the period of Mengistu's dictatorships that followed, um, among the many historical events of the Italian occupation, the use of gas bombing is frequently recalled. In all this book, you will find it in a way or in another, and because it is totally ignored that Italians were among the first to use gas in Africa, in Libya, in 1911. So it is really a record the Italians have, you know, in their minor, minor empire. And uh, Addis Ababa becomes the emblem of an emotional geography uh, in the estrangement caused by the presence of the Italians. Um, Gabriella Germanti says they were everywhere. So many that our city looked like the capital of their country, not of ours any longer. And again, she speaks of the, of the corpses who cover the whole of Addis Ababa after the retaliation, the mass massacre ordered by Graziani um, in 1936, in retaliation for an attempt on his life. Unfortunately, he survived quite well. Um, and of course, there is also the happy moments of the liberation from the Italian as well. Here, the importance of the, the trace created by women's writings along the path of memories, of memory, emerges in all its force, accompanied by the difficulty of its necessary telling. It is an impossible tale to tell because of its atrocity, but it must be told, as Tony Morrison implies, with one powerful sentence, a tale not to pass on, a tale not to pass on, remind us all, as we are here, that however painful it is, we must recover the memory of those atrocities. Germandi's book has a polyphonic structure. It is a narrative jigsaw from uh, uh, many genres, fantasy, history, fiction, and autobiography. Um, based norm, frequently on uh, careful research conducted on historical sources, archival documents, and oral accounts. And she says, I've only been the one who has gathered the stories. It confronts the Italian, the book, the novel, confronts very closely the Italian canon, partly rewriting Ennio Flaiano's A Time to Kill, Tempo di Uccidere, a book, one of the few books from a sort of outstanding uh, Italian author, male author, uh, who has given attention and has spoken of the, you know, of, the, of one soldier's part of, of the Italian occupation in Ethiopia. And she has really rewritten quite closely one of the key scenes in, in the novel, 
And if Lyanna speaks of this dispirited, uh, lost out in the forest uh, uh, soldier, Italian soldier, who then meets a beautiful uh, African uh, local woman, and uh, she's bathing, and, uh, and then, uh, well, the, 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 their contact is very fumbled, and uh, then the intercourse happens, and then he kills her. And she has rewritten this. Of course, the Patriot woman, very naively, but these are also fables, fables, kills the soldier in the end. In fact, it kills the two. And uh, there are other, other things I might notice quickly because I must uh, really go a bit short on this. The presence of harmonic terms and words describing clothes, food, the perfumes, religious rites and festivities evoke a different a culture with a different sense of time and place. Nostalgia crosses the description of the places and of the natural uh, beauty of the distant country. It shows in the notations on smell, food, and language. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, one of the period of the, of the heroine, it is uh, um, working as a student in Bologna, uh, also doing, meeting a lot of women of, of her country, uh, doing the domestic service, and she speaks of the brutality of domestic, foreign domestic service in, in contemporary Italy. And uh, in, in the, the, the accent of smell is, in Italian houses, the lingering smell is opposed to that of home. I quote, a young odor, very short leaves, very short lived, of spices, of roasted coffee, and incense. Again, a space and place find a sensorial reference to taste, sound, touch, and smell, in both in Ali Farah's Madre Piccola, but also in Ijaba Shego's uh, La Mia Casa e Dove Sono, My House is Where I Am. The first one, uh, she speaks in the context of the contorted face, uh, Ali Farah, in the contorted context of the, con sorry, in the context of the contorted faces of, and the multiple locations of the Somali diaspora in the world. She defines those wanderings as, quote, an interior movement from one house to another. You could be anywhere, wherever we took our sound, our smell. So you see the accent on the body, on the black body, which you find on the, in these narratives. Again, in, in the memoir, La Mia Casa e Dove Sono, Shego has spoken of this smell. Saying she's, uh, uh, in La Mia Casa e Dove Sono, it is a reconstruction of a map, the map of Mogadishu. And, uh, and then uh, it's very tiring because she doesn't remember. She, never, she was born in Jabba, was born in Italy. She's Italian, you know, and uh, of Somali parents. But uh, then she reconstructs this map of Mogadishu uh, with the help of other uh, people, Somali people who have been lived there and then escaped. And then she reconstructs it. And the, 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 the map escapes her, but then the smells of the bars, of the coffees on the streets uh, come over, but also it is complete only when she realizes too late that it is not enough, that she must put around it uh, all the places in Rome that she attends, where she was born, where she grew up, the school and everything. So then her map, her personal map of Mogadishu is complete. So you see the living between two worlds. Uh, one quotation I could give of this memoir, from this memoir, is Italy was everywhere, which is not so, so uh, it's not uh, an accent on uh, smells, it sets where it smells, uh, etc. They're not always nice smells. But, uh, and, uh, and then uh, uh, she says, she speaks about uh, the many names that each street building in Mogadishu have, many, many names, because every time there has been a regime, they have changed the names. You know, this is very common with authoritarian regimes. And, uh, and so this is called spoil system. And then they, uh, of course, the names of the Italians are those who linger most in Somalia. And so she says, Italy was everywhere in the names of streets, in the faces of reduced mixed bloods. Italy knew nothing, did not know of our streets with their names or our mythes with their blood. Um, these notations, I 
These notations find a correspondence in Italy, in Italian novels on our side. This is the novel I'm going to stop a bit on. As if in a mirror, some Italian novels that we might call post-colonial have started interrogating the memory of our colonialism. One interesting example is this one, Francesca Giunti's Sangue Giusto, very recent one, a long novel about the Italian occupation of Ethiopia. It narrates the same events following the same similar itinerary that we find in Germande's novel that I just mentioned, but from a different angle, from the angle of an Italian woman of today who has become uh, an, uh, an adolescent. She grew up, Francesca, in Berlusconi's time. And she, she lingers a lot on that as well. As a sort of signal of a correspondence with uh, Germande's novel, the novel starts with the perfume of exotic spices and food from far ori oriental countries. <coughs> uh, it uh, smelled that the heroine Ilaria invariably smells every day when she climbs up to the sixth floor flat where she lives in Piazza Vittorio. Piazza Vittorio is a widely known uh, place of inter-ethnic uh, uh, presence and uh, famous market, inter-ethnic market. This time, coming back from work, she finds a black youth waiting on the landing. His documents give his name as Shimeta Yegmeta Attila Profeti signaling the link to Ilaria's father. It's called Attilio Profeti, Attilio Profeti, really, but then Attila Profeti was sort of Attila for Attilio, you know, which has got probably some meaning. And uh, here we immediately have a reference to the title of the book, Sangue Giusto, as uh, the, the question suspended to the end is whether Shimeta really has the right blood which is what the title means. And this is a very important political uh, contemporary question in Italy, uh, because Italy has got only the use of sanguinis, that is to say, you can become, you are considered Italian, only if your blood has, uh, witnesses it, uh, supports that. You know, if you have the right blood, otherwise, no Italian citizenship. If you are born there, there is no use of soli. Use of sanguinis, but not use of soli. That is to say, the right of the earth, of the land, of where you were born. And in fact, one of the failures of the recent uh, uh, center-left government was that of passing the Ussoli. They could have done it. Maybe they might have made it. But they were afraid to lose the vote. Nevertheless, they lost the vote. And now we have a very different kind of government. If possible, you know, I mean... Uh, the center-left government passed the Libyan alliance, which was is part of the terrible situation of the crossing today. But anyway, let me leave that back. It is well, We are all very bitter about that. We have in this book two narrations, two points of view, two women. One, Ilaria, discovering the hard truth about her father, which is also the hard truth about the Italians, um, and thus providing a look on Italy's brutal colonial history on our side, a look that is Italian. The other, Abeba, the Somali woman who was her father's wife concubine while he was uh, present, was the part of the colonialist uh, uh, army in, in, in Ethiopia. Um, she offers the look of the subaltern on the Italian occupation first and then on the, on the following regimes who have learned, unfortunately, the lessons of the Italian um, and who are not much better. Not too distant from this past is the grim present of the new millennium when immigration is equate, equated with the criminality, literally. Uh, the narration of the hazards and dangers of the crossing is told at length through Shimeta's experience uh, sharing the sea, uh, during the sea passage that he must go through in order to go back to the, to the land of his grandfather, of his presumed grandfather, 
and uh, and that he has or what he has suffered in the atrocious Libyan jails, and here is his vision of migration. Imagine this: you have a wonderful dream while you are perched on the branch of a tree, but you must keep your dream alive, as you must not fall in order to keep your dream. Sorry, but you must keep waking up, though as you must not fall in order to keep your dream alive. This is what migrating means. And he goes on saying, migrating is a total gesture and also a simple one. Um, migrations are like tides, winds, planetary orbits, and childbirths, all phenomena that cannot be stopped, stopped. Certainly not by using violence, Though this delusion is widespread, and this is a delusion that our um, Ministry of the Interior, the fascist Salvini, has. The question this book asks is how we have become what we are. Quite clearly, Ilaria Francesca, through her, is asking that, suggesting the possibility of being Italian in a different way. Here I have a short clip from a film that was made of Sangue Giusto. For this, I have it's a short clip. There is a whole film with the, the titles, the English titles, in fact. But um, this is a film that was made by Sabrina Varani in collaboration with Francesca Melandri. The, it is very difficult to say what comes first, what comes first, whether the novel or, or the film. Mostly the novel, but still, the novel was being written while Francesca, you can see her there, the author of Sangue Giusto, is going to the same, the same itinerary that Gabriella himself, though she's an Ethiopian, made, that is to the archives, to the oral sources, etc. She was in, uh, in, Addis, in Addis Ababa doing that, but also to, to the countryside. She, they, they interviewed people who had survived the occupation. Of course, very old people by now, still there were some. They interviewed other people as well. And so you see here Francesca looking at, uh, at this uh, triumphal announcement of the Duce uh, that uh, says that uh, we have won Ethiopia. <coughs> uh, Ethiopia is Italian. And then uh, the, the film is called uh, Hidden Pages, Pagine Nascoste. And, um, and in this film, the main difference with the novel, it is a very brave uh, decision on Francesca Germ uh, Melandri's part. <laughs> Francesca Germandis, of course, for me, the two women, the four women, you know, etc. So it is two women, two by two, uh, is, uh, is made to this film. Whereas the novel is not autobiographical. In fact, she will insist, my, my father never went to Ethiopia, never went to Africa. So it is not the same, you see, because uh, uh, deal, the dealings, Attilio, Attilio Prophetis' dealings in Ethiopia were very, uh, given in great detail in the, in the book. And uh, my father never went to Ethiopia. In spite of that, she discovers through her research the commitment of her father to Italian fascism, above all, to, the, to his vision of race. And here it is more or less, very little I can show. No, sorry, I went too quickly. di pubblicazione. Anno diciassettesimo era fascista 1939. Papà, hai mai ucciso in guerra? Sì, una volta. Nell'incrocio fra una razza superiore quale noi siamo e una razza inferiore quale sono i negri, non sono gli inferiori che si alzano al livello dei superiori, ma viceversa. E allora sorge la necessità della più assoluta, della più feroce, della più implacabile separazione tra bianchi e negri. Attilio non dimenticava il motivo per cui era andato in Africa da volontario. Gabriele D'Annunzio aveva gridato l'Etiopia italiana da sempre e lui stava realizzando le parole del Vate. Lo riempiva un orgoglio, 
una pienezza mentre viaggiava a gambe ciondoloni sul retro dell'autocarro. They brought the toxic gas full of bad. Mio padre in camicia nera, io non l'avevo mai visto. È mancato il processo alle idee piuttosto che alle persone. I would disagree with the partisan who said that it was the ideas that were not uh, put on trial, which is true, but uh, unlike the people. I think not even the people were put on trial in Italy after fascism you know, for the crimes they had committed at all. And, um, and as I was saying, uh, uh, you've seen Francesca herself, who, who was uh, sort of ready to appear as an actress in this documentary, this documentary film, and also the courage she has of really speaking about her family. In fact, not only the partisan, who is an old friend, in spite of all, he's, uh, of course, a person who paid dearly for his anti-fascist positions, but he was a friend of Attilio Profeti, and he says, well, you know, we, we knew one another as young people, and he was an educated fascist. So, you see, there was such a thing as being educated fascist. Um, the, fun, the terrible thing was that this is where Francesca is very brave when she discovers, when she looks at la difesa della razza, which means the defense of race, it is a notorious uh, magazine uh, from the fascist era, and she discovers her father writing as late as 1945 an argument defending the difference, the racial difference, saying that The most important thing in, in colonialism, it is the white race is above, the black race is underneath. The important thing is to have a sharp distinction between the two. And so that was really the discovery. And she even has the courage to let her mother still alive now to be interviewed. Well, uh, the novel is different. The novel is a novel, and so, and that is, of course, better than the real facts. Um, I should now speak about another novel, but I won't be able, I won't do that. It is called the Timira, Romanzo Meticcio, hybrid novel, because it is written by the Wooming Collective with a Somali Italian woman, one of the daughters of colonialism, because she was born of one uh, Italian uh, colonialist and, and a, a Somali woman, a Somali. But then she emigrated, was, her father was one of the few Italian men Uh, who decided to take back to Italy uh, the little bastarda, bastardella, as it says in Italian, una bastardella, timira, eh? uh, taken her to, to Italy. Uh, some of the Italians, after they left, they had to leave the, the empire, the so-called empire, they took the children back to Italy. And of course, as we know from this novel, it was not all roses. And, but I, I can't really uh, tell much about this. Both novels tell the story, both, both uh, Sangue Giusto and Timira, tells the story of a woman's formation within a framework and the context, recalling the female post-colonial works discussed about, those by Germandi, Alifara, Shego, and many others, which I have not mentioned, and which go to most very recent writings. The condition of exile, the sense of being inside out, becomes here the condition of life and thought the foundation of a poetical vision. Here I could recall the elaboration of that Denise Ferreira da Silva has made of the vision of a black feminist poetics, which as was already said this morning, is also deeply political. Poetics as politics. And uh, this is what is given by these books. 
Uh, at the end of again Monday's novel, there is a return to a mythical past of the country, to a wonderful, the wonderful uh, Ethiopian landscape. You saw the epigraphy at the beginning, you know, the flowers, and here are the flowers of the land, ancient names of ancient uh, eldest uh, ancestors, etc., and also the folklore and the, the, the magic of the tales and the fables that uh, Mallet uh, is told, but also, above all, of simply the landscape of Ethiopia. There's a beautiful Italian film by Guadagnino called The Italian Unconscious, which very cleverly, after, after uh, interviewing in the first part, it's a film documentary. Uh, you know Guadagnino probably for other films, but uh, recent films. This is a, a, a completely unknown film. It is called The Italian Unconscious, which is, of course, colonialism, and it is about Ethiopia. He interviewed in the first part quite a few scholars, a bit boring, with, including here. And uh, that was his chance of becoming a star, but it didn't go beyond that, <laughs> unfortunately. And, uh, and so this first part is just a series of historians, you know, etc. It's giving all the history that uh, in fiction I have examined, etc. The second part is only, uh, this is the clever thing, this is an Italian ex-colonialist filmmaker, man, what is more, you know? And, uh, well, yes, the second part is only landscaping, nothing else. It's just the shots of Ethiopia, 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 in all its valleys and mountains and, and everything, and that's it, without any words. Music. He has got this thing about the music, which is very accidental. Um, um, so, let me leave Gabriella Germandi. Uh, the picture she gives of the past of a country creates uh, an anchor between what it was, what it has become, and still might be through a writing that in recovering a missed memory opens to a future of solidarity and proximity. Uh, the black Italian writings I have tried to describe here speak of different worlds linking a, a mythical past, a colonial and racist present, and a utopian future of mending and reparation. I could quote here the very important work that Elizabeth Grosch has done on that, but I will leave it out. This happens to the writings, as I have said, but also sometimes through singing. And here I would like to play a song by Karima Tuji. She is born in Rome of Liberian parents. I don't know whether you know, but probably you all know that Liberia is an African state that was founded by the ex-American slaves. They went back there and founded a new state. So it is, again, itself Liberia, a sort of knot that speaks of Afrofeminism, Afrofuturism of a feminist kind. Um, she's a dancer, singer, and a video maker. She speaks from the position of a second generation migrant, uh, though she's among the youngest of the, of the generation that I have presented this afternoon. They were all second generation, but uh, there are younger ones yet. She turns her gaze on us, on our racism, like many of these novels, on our racist stereotypes, not without irony, uh, there are two songs who are quite well known among young people who are a sort of burlesque of the Berlusconi e years. One is called uh, Orangutang and the other is Banga Banga, Bunga Bunga. And if you want to see them, they are on YouTube, of course, so you can see them if you want to laugh at us, which is good, you know, to, to laugh at us. I hope you are in the position of being in a good position to laugh at us. Um, but also she sings of the borders we construct against exiles and refugees. And uh, there is, I will show this video uh, and song, the song that uh, the video is made out of the song. And on the whole, I would, I'm glad to stop on her, to finish on her, because she has spoken about her as being Afro-feminist. I don't know what she, what she really means by that, but certainly, in a sense, she does represent whatever I have tried to say uh, this afternoon without really ever mentioning it, which is, as Ranjana said, uh, the, uh, the center of my most recent uh, uh, work and, and research on the 
this new ecological look and this new sort of recent art, African, that is African at the center of its look, but at the same time looks at the interstellar journey. A spaceship, probably, it's the only hope we have, hoping that because it will be a slave ship only for black people, that there is a space for us. And here is Karima. One thing I might want to say, just the last sentence as in way of a conclusion, is that uh, the many people dying in the Mediterranean just now, in the last years, there are thousands. 
and uh, they show once more that uh, the black body can be completely expendable and that uh, black lives do not matter. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. So we will open it up to questions um, again. Feel free to come to the table if, um, if you'd like to. And um, if you have a question, it would be good to use the mic for it's for more for recording than it is for amplification. Um, so let me open it up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the big room <laughs> um, is it yes it is working um, thank you so much Lydia I have a question that is I mean uh, this is a very wide-ranging talk and forgive me because I'm going to ask you a very specific question about the novels um, most of these are books that I know well and teach so I'm I've got my own obsession with them um, you mentioned the opening scene of the Flayano novel, the book that comes out in the immediate post-war era, the only book of its time that really sort of gives a hint, Flayano. Um, and it's a scene, that opening scene that's so violent, but it's so much about the Italian man, he's lost. He just happens to kill this woman, it's a terrible thing, but it's really about him. And the whole book is going to be about him. But that scene haunts quite a few of these books, as you pointed out in talking about, now I actually can't remember which one, uh, the Germandi. So I, when you mentioned the Wu Ming book, Later, the Timira book, I, until that point, I thought you were only going to talk about books by women, and I was going to ask you about that. But then you mentioned the Wu Ming book. So this leads me to actually a more specific question. The Wu Ming book is by, it's a collective of male writers. And then there's also a recent book, I Fantasmi, no? I was going to ask you a question about another recent book that you did not mention. So if you haven't read it, that's fine with me. I can't get through it myself. That's why I want to ask other people. It's titled I Fantasmi dell'Impero. It's by three men. Um, and they also have an echo of the Flayano scene, except it's extremely military. Is this, you, it's not part of your domain of novels? No, anyone else? want to tell me about this book that I can't bring myself to read? Okay, well, that was my question. Thank you so much. No, <laughs> better I agree. It is true what you say, because, sorry, I... Um, well, first of all, I must say that uh, Gabriella Germandi recognizes in the postscript where she lists all the... Uh, sources she has used in Addis Ababa and all the ways in which she has co collected her work because she was too young, of course. She couldn't remember herself. She had to go to, to, through the archives, and she did quite uh, punctually. She does recognize, though, of course, the, the novel could be read, could be seen as a, a terrible indictment of any of Rayana's book which I think he deserves, personally. But Gabriella says she's one of the few Italian male writers who has given attention, has understood something about the plight of, of this bad uh, empire enterprise. Because it is true that the, the man who is at the center, who is very autobiographical, you know, uh, who is at the center of the novel, is a lost out personality. Today, the judges, if he, uh, they would acquit him out of rape, because he is in a mental, he was in a mental confusion state, you know? Because he is in a mental confusion state, because he understands that that enterprise has got no meaning, uh, no, no real uh, purpose, and it is a losing, uh, a losing battle, <laughs> literally, in a sense, you know? And uh, so it, it is 
one thing is that, and then, uh, and then what he does, he does it as if in a daze, you know, the woman he likes, so then he would not kill her, but then he kills her because he thinks after the, uh, the uh, uh, sexual encounter, he goes in a slumber, men normally do, it seems, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then he just uh, thinks she's an animal and, and shoots. And then uh, she's only wounded, he could help her, but then he decides what work shall I do, and then he kills her. So it is nearly an accident, you know. And, uh, but Ennio Flaiano, of course, is also speaking about uh, the, the losing aspect of the, of the imperial. So in a sense, I agree with Gabriella, who says, it's one of the few books that I really, I really like, I really think they are good, etc. But in spite of that, of course, she does, in speaking very minutely about the ugliness of the Italian occupation and of the resistance, which is many casualties, one of the things, uh, the central themes of uh, Gabriella Germandi's book is uh, the interracial uh, um, couple um, with one of uh, the relatives of the of Mallet, Mallet's relatives, Mallet is the, the, the heroine, uh, she uh, marries an Italian soldier. And when they are both discovered, she's killed in the open, she's hanged in the open, and he is shot in, in the tent. Because, of course, she must pay the law, the fascist law said you must pay if you, inter, if you have interracial intercourse or even marriage, in this case, really the utmost crime, then uh, you, uh, you must uh, be executed. But then he is executed in, in a hidden space, she is executed publicly the Ethiopian girl. So it is mainly about that. That is really the central, emotional center of the novel, you know. And, uh, and then, of course, it is creation, it is fiction, but on the other hand, it is also real. And then, uh, uh, so in a sense, she, when, uh, so the book is about the death, of course, it's about the, the ugliness, but then she also speaks of the heroic resistance of women, which is really the center of this novel, which I didn't say anything about. If I should say, in in a sentence, what is this novel about? It is about the female participation in the Ethiopian resistance, really. In, in every minute way, it is described with the names and things. Some of them are mythical figures, but you know, those things. So it is not easy, of course, to, in these cases, in oral history or account, oral accounts, to see what is uh, true, etc. Now, when uh, you, we come to Wuming uh, to Timira, which is your question, yes. Uh, Timira is written partly by one of a collective of men. Of men. Women have done a lot of interesting work on the empire, on, on you know, racism, on very interesting work. And um, then, uh, in this case, the reason why there is a that title, hybrid novel, Timira, a hybrid novel, un romanzo meticcio, is because, uh, uh, because she was a meticcia, you know, one of the metis that Ijaba Sheg mentions in that thing, that Italians knew nothing about, about the mixed blood children of the empire, you know? So she's a mixed blood child, but it is really about the authorship of this novel. Because you see, I don't have the time to say that this was a character of the first wave of writing. Feven Abha Tekle, Libera, I, you know, very sort of, I'm a, I'm a tendentious feminist. So I only mentioned her, but I should have said in collaboration with, and then there is the name of the journalist who really wrote the novel, the first novel I quoted. And the, he wrote the novel, she, she, she spoke to him, uh, she record, he recorded what, you know, so that novel, that novel I first, the first one I mentioned, Again, is, is a very typical product of the first uh, wave of immigration, which I would not call, I would not call second generation, it is first generation people. There are quite a few, very interesting one. The most famous one is far off from Mogadishu, another very important, she wrote it herself because she knew Italian. Because you know, some of the people who had to run out of the country, uh, either Somalia or Eritrea or Ethiopia, they, they, uh, they had gone to Italian schools because they were participating, they were part of an elite, let us say, like Jabashego's parents. Jabashego's parents had to fly from the political regime because they had been you know, quite powerful in the fascist occupation. 
And they had been, uh, what to say, uh, of officers, of the fascist officers. And so they had to fly out. And then Ijab has no fault about that. It's like Francesca Melandri. She was born in Rome. She, she knows nothing about that. But I mean, that is, it is a very complex history. It's not so simple, you know. It is yeah. intercrossing all the time. Yeah. So now, what happens to Wu Ming in this case? Wu Ming take, uh, take. Uh, uh, sorry, I was saying about the first. Year. So there was this. There is a, this big, big thing. But there's a whole book in English, uh, uh, edited by Fran Merolla, Daniela Merolla and Gabriella Parati, which is Mediterranean Crossing, I think, something like that. Well, maybe not. That is your title. Well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe it may be Mediterranean Italy, something like that. And they speak mainly about the combined authorship of the migrant narrative. So that is a very tricky thing, you know. It is part of the first wave. I never felt I could really, because I'm fundamentally a feminist uh, and a cultural studies, but also a literary critic, so I never felt I could safely move on the text that were written maybe by an Italian or maybe in collaboration. I've worked on one novel by a Palestinian refugee. And that is a very interesting case because three women collaborated. So it's among them, her daughter, Ruba Sali. She's called Salva Salem. And she wrote a beautiful novel in Italian that is translated into, into English by an American uh, woman called With the Wind in My Hair. And uh, that is interesting because that is a writing that is mixed uh, writing, but it is one woman with the three, uh, uh, one author with the three uh, uh, women helping her, three feminists. And so she died very early. In fact, most of the book was written after the death. Of her. So let us go back to Timira. Women save their face, their souls with the fact that the one man who co-wrote the book, because there is only one, they don't give the name of the author, though it is easy to discover it, you can discover it, you know. It is a collective, so they say, who Ming? And in this case, he uh, cooperated with Timira herself, because Timira died only in the last year, just a few months before the book is finished. And he interviewed her, registered the discourse. She wrote some of the book herself because she knew perfect Italian. She had moved to Italy when she was two, una bastardella, you know? Uh, she was Italian, of course. And though she has a very wicked stepmother, like in fables, on the other hand, well, of course, uh, it's also, she must also be justified. What would you say if your husband came back with the bastardella saying, look, I have made this with my concubine in Ethiopia. Now you are her mother. Of course, she was not her mother, and she did not want to be. She really hated her. But anyway, so that is the fable part, and which is also very real, of course. And then uh, uh, Timira spoke perfect Italian. And you know, Timira herself, she's quite, uh, well, uh, not famous, but uh, near famous because she appeared in a famous Italian film, which some of you may have heard of, you are all too young, called Riso Amaro, Bitter Eyes. It is about the... <coughs> she was one of the rice, uh, yes. Mondine, rice... Uh, Harvest uh, collectors, you know, the women, you may have seen a clip of it. If you go, if you go on the internet, you will see this old film uh, with Silvana Mangano, who was the main Mondina. But then there were many Mondine around her with, you know, they, because I had to be in the, in the, in water up to their knees, of course, it was a very sec sensual uh, view of it, you know, it's nearly pornographic, these women all with their shoes, uh, their legs oh. naked. And, and she was one of them. She was a beautiful half-blood. And, uh, and uh, the only way she could survive in Rome when she finally escaped her stepmother um, was uh, to go in filmmaking with the side, uh, side uh, uh, roles, you know, I mean, small roles. But still, she did have quite a few roles. This is the famous one. You can still, if you see an old version of Riso Amaro, Bitter Rice, you can see Timira herself. So Timira co-wrote some of the books. So in this case, though I unwillingly went back to a book that is, that is uh, of course, mixed authorship, 
Uh, on the other hand, it is true that uh, Timira in this case is very, very recent, and it is not so recent as Sangue Giusto. It is 2012, uh, but uh, uh, Sangue Giusto is a the year before last, the last really. And, um, but still, it does address the pro today uh, the uh, memory of the Italian conquest of, of Somalia in this case. You know, it is not Ethiopia like Sangue Giusto, but it's Somalia. Uh, then if you, I don't know whether you asked me about maybe about the, whether there is a literature alongside the female narratives I presented, why there is a male narrative of, uh, of migrancy this day. There's a lot of male writers, of course, but uh, not particularly addressing the empire, I don't, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. I've read some, at the beginning I read a lot actually, and then I found I had so much to do with the female narratives of this kind <laughs> that uh, I left it. Lydia, could, could you say something? Um, oh, hang on, I just twisted my knee. <laughs> um, about, um, about, the, about the senses a little bit more. Um, you, you were talking a little bit at the at the beginning about um, uh, when you were looking at a particular quote. Oh, I don't know what I did to my knee. Sorry, I just twisted it in a funny way. Um, about um, about smell um, and th the different kinds of senses that 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 move through these novels um, and the way memory might might. Uh, might live in the senses, as it were. Um, I'm sort of interested in thinking about uh, how, um, how uh, these writers are pushing against, um, pushing against amnesia, as it were, um, in ways that aren't just about telling telling a story that it hasn't been told um, or, um, or telling a story that should be told that everyone knows but denies or so in ways that are different from amnesty say um, or uh, um, deliberate forgetting um, but manifest themselves in senses it, it seemed as if you were as if as if this question of smell was something that that was coming up um, in the in some of the texts. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, of course. Mm. Well, I mean, you know, because uh, starting with the book you mentioned mm. uh, as far back as 1996, uh, yeah. uh, and also going on above all with La Voce dell'Altra, mm. I have worked a lot about the, the narratives. Uh, on the body, right. telling all the stories about the body. And of course, uh, we have the example of Toni Morrison yeah. speaking about slavery through the um, hieroglyphics that it was written on Seth's body right. by the whip. Right. And the whip is a sort of history of racism. And because she can't, uh, has left those, uh, uh, that history on her back, she can't see it. And therefore, she wants to ignore it, which is also the emblem of the killing of her daughter. Mm. Because she, with killing her daughter, she wanted to erase slavery. Right. Because her daughter was a new slave, therefore it was a sort of uh, cross on right. slavery. Right. And, uh, and the whip has written that history and she can't see it till she's then forced to see it mm. when the ghost of her daughter reappears. That, that is to say, is facing up to slavery. And so I have spoken a lot about that. For instance, Asia Diebar, I've written a lot about that, about Asia Diebar, for instance, <laughs> speaking of the, of the uh, traces that were left on, on uh, women's breasts yeah. uh, due to the to torture right. during the Algerian Revolution. And then she speaks a lot, always in terms of the bodies. She speaks of the torture in great details. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then she also speaks about the traces left by that torture on the body mm -hmm. and uh, on the, on the uh, also the moment when the revolution is ended, then it's all forgotten. Mm -hmm. 
the women know that they have those atrocities. Sometimes they don't have breasts any longer, you know, and uh, due to torture. But then she also speaks about the fact that after the revolution, women were put under the veil. Above all, there was a bandage on their mouth. Mm. Uh, so they, they can become voiceless. They must become voiceless again right. after the revolution, right. unfortunately. And I could go on with these examples that I have given. Uh, the major examples in my case come from these two I have just mentioned, but also from, uh, from Indian women. Indian mm -hmm. novels are full of telling history on through the female body, mm -hmm. really. And so I have developed in this second book, La Voce dell'Altra, uh, The Voice of the Other, which has just been reissued re with, with the post faction. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have written about that, about, uh, about how those females, the link between stories and, and the bodies, mm -hmm. uh, have really come out in transcultural women's narratives, mm -hmm. really, very mm -hmm. strongly, mm -hmm. speaking through the body. So that right. is the, the reason why then I find that uh, uh, today it is important to, un to underline in these more recent narratives, mm -hmm. and also uh, mm -hmm. Italian, you know, sort of uh, referred to a minor empire, to mm -hmm. a minor history, uh, etc. Uh, of course, it is important to see that even there, there is a lot about this uh, different ways. It is a different way of, of uh, inhabiting time and space. I think Ian said something about that this morning. And it is a different way of inha inhabiting side and space. Going by smell, going by uh, the touch mm -hmm. and the sight, and you can see sometimes there is an endless kind of list of the five senses mm -hmm. in its many manifestations, also referred to rites and festivities, etc., and words, of course, the words in the original language, but above all, the smells, the smells. Mm -hmm. This quotation I have given, uh, when the domestic servant, which is very important in, uh, in Germandi's book, she says, I've lived in a very cold place for many years mm -hmm. after she goes back to her country, fortunately for her. And she can go, and uh, and then uh, she says, uh, then uh, that this thing about uh, the smell, because she's of course assisting in Italy. Many domestic servants are really badanti. You know, the Italian word means uh, badanti, uh, looking yeah. after, uh, caring for. You know, yeah. uh, the carers, carers. Mm -hmm. I, I right. translated. In fact, the common word for Italian migrants, for of, uh, migrants from other countries in Italy, it's badante. It's, it's funny, it's uh, the person who cares for, you know, mm. because mm. they have mainly been used for children and above all for old people. Right. And, uh, and therefore uh, to assist in the older people, maybe even in this country, I don't know. Certainly mm. it is very common in Italy. Yeah. And then, uh, then of course, uh, she has the experience about uh, places in Italy where there is uh, lingering smells, the smell of old age in her experience, right. but I mean, maybe it is quite true that Italian houses don't have the fresh smell of, <laughs> of those countries, of my, my home country, she said, where we open windows, there is wind everywhere, and sometimes there are no windows because it is open tents and things like that, yeah. but also, she says, because we are all young in comparison, mm. because they have died, you know, we must not forget that when they speak about the Italian occupation, in particular Ethiopia, Hundreds of people, hundreds and thousands of people have died. I mean, they were proper massacres. When Addis Abeba was practically destroyed by, in the retaliation, in the Graziani retaliation, I mean, the corpses were thousands in the whole, in the town. They were everywhere, and they were all absolutely, you know, tortured, uh, the, uh, cut into pieces, and things like that. And there is. We, you find this description not only over this suburb, also in other countries, but certainly Ethiopia is because of the resistance, you see. Because the other countries, it is a complex uh, imperialism, you know, it, in its uh, brevity, because the other countries were slightly different. Ethiopia mm. was, because it resisted, it was really, really destroyed, you know. And many, many people were killed. So she's also speaking about how they're mostly young people, so there is the, mm -hmm. the smell of young people. So I think that, of course, this link in the female narratives between the body and, and, uh, and events and, uh, and these histories, if you like, it is very important. It is history reincarnated. 
which is incredibly important, really. It is, uh, as we said, another a way of inhabiting time and space differently, differently, where the rationalist ego is not so strong. Mm -hmm. It is a different kind of culture, mm -hmm. a different ways of going. And, uh, and I find that, of course, you know, um, recently, because I've been working on uh, black female science fiction, well, I find that very, very important. Take Octavia Butler. Mm -hmm. I mean, the body, the senses are very important. Take the tentacular uh, coexistence that Octavia Butler, on the line of Donna Haraway, mind you, who is not black, but still, uh, we can't ignore that mm -hmm. because uh, Donna, when she writes her book, her most recent book, Staying with the Trouble, she speaks mainly about, yes, Ursula Le Guin, but above all, about Octavia Butler. She uses her a lot. Yeah. So when she speaks of tentacular thinking, Donna, she's speaking mainly, taking the, the metaphor, if you like, the idea, the sense, from, from uh, Octavia. Yeah. Because Octavia Butler in Dawn, in the Xenogenesis Genesis trilogy, which is called also Lilith's Brood, well, Octavia speaks about these people with tentacles who are neither male nor female, mm -hmm. uh, who are neither human or, or animal, you know, mm -hmm. they are really a mixture of organic and inorganic. Then the, the tentacles are really the way of creating the world, creating this table, creating these worlds, creating everything, and then expressing themselves, smelling, touching, copulating, finding pleasure, sexual pleasure, everything. The tentacles are a sensory uh, expression of, of uh, life, of really how to get in contact with others. And above all, I would say uh, how uh, to think differently. Otherwise, we would not be thinking about the tentacular thinking. Mm -hmm. A new kind of thought, mm -hmm. which comes out of many of these narratives, not only science fiction, but, well, I know a lot about black science fiction these mm -hmm. days, mm -hmm. and there is a lot of that, really. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, I mean, uh, there are more recent authors, like uh, Nady Okorafor or uh, with Binti, again, the tentacles, because there are medusas in it, etc. Mm -hmm. And the tentacle is very important because it is uh, the main expression of uh, communication, really. Mm -hmm. Of all the things I said, the most important thing is communicating. And so it is communi communicating through the body, really, mm -hmm. communicating through sensorial. Uh, to, to the senses, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, if you take the parables, which are you know, the most important, in my opinion, one of the most important novels of the end of the last century, uh, two novels, this is, uh, she never wrote the third one. And uh, the two novels are very important because the parables are about uh, a woman who has uh, empathic powers. That is to say, she comes in contact with whoever, in physical contact, in sensory contact with whoever is in front of her. And therefore, mm -hmm. she can co communicate as if she were one body with the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance, uh, the example she gives, uh, which is a strong uh, argument against war for peace, is that whenever she's obliged in the very difficult times she goes to, she has to fight, she has to kill people, then she suffers that herself. Mm -hmm. Whenever she kills an opponent, she goes through that. Then mm -hmm. she resurrects. The other does not, if she, you know. But then again, uh, I, I find that uh, Butler is very important in this sense to give you this, uh, in my itinerary that I've gone through Algerian, Franco-Algerian writers, uh, who was my main, probably my main uh, uh, inspiration for the, uh, for the 19, for the first edition of La Voce dell'Altra, uh, then uh, I have gone through all that and I have found that in many women, uh, also in, as I say, in Indian women, etc. But uh, then I ended up with Octavia, recently Octavia Butler, finding in her a very powerful translation of this idea mm -hmm. of uh, 
of a time and space that goes in another dimension, which is that of the senses and of the body. Thank you. Well, we are out of time. We started a little bit late, so if there's any, if there's a any any other question that people want to raise, so maybe we could just continue less formally. Um, but thank you both, thank um, you. Lydia, especially right now, and for both of you. Thank you.